We're going to call this meeting to order. It is now 631. Okay. Welcome. Um, seeing that we have a quorum of the town councilors present, we are officially calling the meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being broadcast live and, and recorded by Amherst Media. So copies of the agenda are projected on the wall in both the screens uh, and are posted in, the, in advance of the meeting. If you are interested in speaking during the meeting, please sign the sheet at the back of the room. Do we remember a sheet? Yes. Huh? There's no sheet there. Okay. We'll put one there, not to worry. We like to collect your names because that way we know exactly what the name is. Um, we will not have public comment, however, until toward the end of the meeting. Um, so let me begin with announcements. Um, first of all, are there any counselors with announcements? Okay. Then uh, I have two. First of all, as many of you are aware, we have postponed our, vi our vote on the temporary station bridge, road bridge until February 6th. At that, as, at that time, as required by the charter, section 5.6, supplementary budgets, other appropriations, we will hold a public forum called by the town council. Immediately following the public forum, the council will vote on two motions that have been recommended unanimously by the town council's finance committee at their meeting on January 22nd, 2019. Okay. We apologize for the delay, but we're also trying to meet by the letter of the law. Um, We're going to move into um, the, um, I just realized something didn't print. Okay, let me also mention. Um, later on this, this evening, approximately 8.30, we are going to go into executive session, um, at which point, Oh, Jesus, sorry. Off. Everybody else? <laughs> Checking? Thank you. Um, and we will convene in the small room in the back of this room. Uh, we anticipate that the executive session will, will last no longer than 15 to 30 minutes. And we have, if, not, if we have not completed our regular agenda at that time, don't laugh. We will convene immediately following the executive session back in this room. If we have by chance completed it, we will not reconvene following the executive session. So our first order of business is actually two resolutions. The first is actually presented by uh, Anastasia Ordinez, yes. I guess this one stays on. <laughs> Good evening. Um, thank you all and to the town manager uh, for granting time for me to speak with you tonight about the Fund Our Future campaign and to ask that you support it by joining the dozens of communities around the Commonwealth that have already passed local resolutions, signed petitions, and shown their support in other ways for this important initiative. In your packets, you will have seen a copy of the resolution passed by the Amherst School Committee in December of 2018. This resolution was passed following years of advocacy by our school committee and our superintendent, Dr. Morris, and others uh, to raise awareness among our state elected leaders about the negative impact that an outdated state foundation budget formula has on our schools. I'm here tonight asking that you consider passing a similar resolution from the Amherst Town Council as soon as you can. The Education Reform Act of 1993 established a constitutional right to provide a high quality education to every student within the Commonwealth, regardless of wealth, income, educational background, or zip code. The rationale for this was that a high quality education is a shared responsibility among all of us to ensure that our children grow to become active participants in our democracy and productive members of our economy. 
The nuts and bolts way that the legislature ensured a high quality public education for every child was by using a complex formula nicknamed the foundation budget to calculate how much each district would be required to spend on their public schools loosely based on the size and makeup of a district's financial well-being and school enrollment. The state would then ensure that every district has sufficient resources to meet its foundation budget spending level using a funding formula titled Chapter 70. Unfortunately, the foundation budget has not been updated since 1993. And while education costs continue to increase because, let's face it, most things in life don't usually get cheaper with every passing year, the foundation budget has remained more or less unchanged. School districts, school committees, and advocates across the state have been adamantly asking the Commonwealth for years to update the foundation budget. So to study the problem, the legislature voted to form the Foundation Budget Review Commission in 2015. The Foundation Budget Review Commission, chaired by State Senator Sonia Chang Diaz and State Representative Alice Peisch, published its report in late 2015. The commission found that the state is currently underfunding our combined districts approximately $1 billion a year. From the report, I'm just going to read this to you. Commission also undertook its task recognizing that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DESE, has in recent years, consistent with both the original Education Reform Act and subsequent amendments to the law, including the Achievement Gap Act of 2010, been ramping up efforts to hold districts and schools accountable for results and to ensure that every effort is being made to identify reduce and eliminate remaining achievement gaps. It was a special moral and fiscal focus of the commissions then to make sure that the schools and districts most likely to be held accountable for bringing high need students to proficiency also had sufficient resources to meet those standards and educate their high needs populations to the same standards as other students by reviewing the adequacy and efficacy of the ELL and low income rates in the formula. The Commission's report highlighted the huge disparities that exist among communities. Districts of about the same size can expect to face very different costs depending on their demographics. Amherst is considered one of the state's wealthier districts, yet we have a high need student population, so it costs more to ensure that each of our students has a high quality education. If the foundation budget were to be revised and updated, Amherst District could receive approximately $264,000 a year, depending on the model that is implemented, and approximately $358,000 for the region. But while any added amount owed and paid to our districts would help our public schools and relieve pressure off our town's finances, there are some communities owed much, much more. It is grossly unacceptable that our state allows this inequality to continue any longer. By passing a resolution and supporting the Fund Our Future campaign, the Amherst Town Council is taking an important step towards letting the state know that revising the foundation budget this year will bring much needed relief to all of our public schools in all of our communities. This is an important time when state legislators are poised to prioritize public education funding, and so the time for this kind of leadership and advocacy is now. Thank you for your attention. And the resolution is in your folders and was shared with you online. Um, and do I hear a motion to accept? And that was Pat and a second. I second it. Dorothy, thank you. Any further discussion? Yes, Mandy Jo. Just a quick question to, to our School chair over here. Um, where did you send it to once it was adopted? So who should we be forwarding this to if we adopt it? Well, so there is a Fund Our Future campaign, and there is an email address that we can send it to, and it makes sure that the resolution that is passed is then uh, publicly accessible on their website. But you can send it to us, and we can take care of it from there. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, call the question. All those in favor? It is unanimous. Thank you so much. We are prepared to sign it this evening. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I am going to exercise our ability to bring in one other resolution that we did not have 48 hours in advance, 
And that is a resolution particularly about Black History Month. I've asked uh, Dorothy Pam to read that resolution for us. Uh, it was given to us by the local ACLU. <clears throat> Whereas, since the bicentennial year of 1976, Americans of all walks of life have come together during the month of February to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Whereas, these accomplishments are the more remarkable for having been won at the cost of great struggle and sacrifice by men and women who came to these shores in chains and by their descendants. Whereas the authors of these accomplishments in Massachusetts history include Phyllis Wheatley, the first African American to publish a book of poetry, Crispus Attucks, the first casualty in the American of the American Revolution, Edward Jones of Amherst College, the second African American to earn a college degree, Edmonia Lewis, the first professional African American sculptor who learned her craft in Boston, the members of the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, the first and most famous unit of African-American Union soldiers raised in the Civil War, Jan Metzeliger, inventor who had revolutionized the shoe ma manufacturing industry, W.E.B. Du Bois, pioneering scholar and civil rights activist, Edward Brooke, the first African-American senator elected by popular vote, Deval Patrick, the second elected African-American governor in the nation. <clears throat> Whereas captive Africans and free people of color while already part of the, of the Amherst story in the colonial era, whereas the first African-American residents of Amherst have fought in our collective defense and freedom from the revolution and civil wars to the present, whereas the African-American community, some of whose distinguished figures are depicted on the history mural in West Cemetery, continues to contribute to the rich diversity and general welfare of both the town of Amherst and the Commonwealth. Whereas, to its shame, Massachusetts participated in the slave trade since 1638, but to its honor, in 1783 became the first state in the new nation to abolish slavery as inconsistent with our own conduct and the Constitution, thereby demonstrating our determination to live up to our historical ideals as we strive to build a better common future. <clears throat> Whereas, as former President Barack Obama proclaimed, every American can draw strength from the story of hard-won progress, which not only defines the African-American experience, but also lies at the heart of our nation as a whole. Now, therefore, we the town council of the town of Amherst do hereby proclaim February 2019 as Black History Month and urge all residents to mark this occasion and to participate fittingly in its observance beginning with a flag-raising ceremony to be held in front of Town Hall on February 3rd, 2019. Voted on this 28th day of January 2019. Do I hear a motion to adopt this proclamation? Dorsey, and a second? Which one? <laughs> anyway, Pat. Um, any further discussion or questions? Yes, Alyssa. Thank you. And so the select board did this every year, and so I'm very pleased that it came back to us this year. The only question I had is we sometimes have some confusion over what day of the week it is. It was typically the second Saturday. Is it really this coming Sunday? Are we certain of that? Just to be sure, because sometimes day date things don't work the way we expect. We will check on that and change the date accordingly if necessary. Okay, yes. Thank you. There is an advertisement out for it that was put out by Kathleen Anderson and the Human Rights Commission, and it's Sunday the 3rd. Okay. All right. But do you have the time on that? I think it's 1 to 2, but don't hold me to that. I think it's, um, it's 1.30, but we'll double check on it. Okay, It'll thank you Early afternoon. Much. Okay. Uh, is there any other, are there any other further questions on this one? Yes. One of these days I will learn to do this. Um, I, I feel very strongly to support this uh, resolution, as we all do, but I really want to speak to some of the people here, uh, particularly from our schools, about the need for Black History Month to be 
10 months long to be, we should know um, our history. Uh, we should know the values that this country was actually built on. And if we examine those values, we're gonna have to take a pretty critical look at ourselves because we can set a date that we ended slavery, but we never really ended slavery in this country. Um, I won't go on about which amendments still allow slavery, um, but I really encourage our schools to be doing this all year long, and our community. Okay, any other comment? Okay, hearing none, call the question. All those in favor? And it is unanimous. Thank you. Um, we do not have any scheduled hearings tonight, so we are going to proceed with our presentation. Uh, and we have a very important presentation by the Amherst Public Schools. Um, it's regarding their, the process of the application to the Massachusetts School Building Authority for a new elementary school. And we have both Mike Morris with us as superintendent of schools and Anastasia Ordinez as the Amherst School Committee Chair. Um, and they will be making the presentation. However, before, and, and there will be no public comment, but I do want to recognize one other person in the room, and that is Jean Fay, president of the Amherst Pelham Teachers Association. And draw to your attention the letter that is in your packet and all of the many, many signatures supporting that letter. Okay? So um, with all of that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and Anastasia. Thank you for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here, be back again. It was a couple weeks ago that we were talking more generally about the schools, and I'm um, really pleased to be back to kind of do a condensed version of what was shared at the school committee about two weeks ago um, on, this, on the same topic, which is how do we achieve consensus and how do we have uh, apply for a grant uh, that will support us to improve the learning conditions for our student and the work conditions for our staff. Uh, and have buildings that makes our community proud about what we provide for our students. So uh, I'm going to try to condense right for school committee. I think this was like 35 minutes. Um, so we're going to try to do about 15. So I apologize if the pacing feels quick, um, but there's, you know, in talking to the chair, there'll be plenty of time for discussion and <laughs> questions afterwards. So kind of more generally, um, we have a significant need, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment, to replace or renovate two of our three Amherst Elementary schools. Um, and for me, you know, I always think of problems as opportunities, um, and I think there really is an opportunity for our community to come together uh, and support this process. Certainly there's a challenge. I'll get to a proposal, uh, and we'll talk about the process moving forward, which I know will be of high interest to the counselors tonight. So the problem, um, so there are many problems. I'm gonna summarize this in, in three sort of buckets. Um, so one is building conditions. So the MSBA, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, they estimate the lifespan of school buildings to be 50 years. And Wildwood's at 48. Uh, Fort River's not far behind. And you might say, well, homes in this community have lasted for hundreds of years. Homes generally don't have hundreds of students and staff walking through at 180 days a year. And so the wear and tear on our elementary schools has been significant, even separate from the other problems which we have. Um, our systems are starting to fail. So I was at Fort River on Thursday. I counted 18 leaks in the roof that day that it was raining. Um, and our other schools also had similar problems. Um, you know, all these systems that are original to the building are really struggling, and it's having a significant impact on our ability to um, do what our task is, which is to educate the students of Amherst. We have significant safety challenges as well. For instance, the front entry is, you know, about 90 feet from where the main office is. You would never be able to build a school building uh, that way now. While we do have a video system that checks for who's coming in, anyone who gets in our building can have access to students well before they ever come close to the office. That's one example uh, of some of the safety challenges. Again, I'm, I'm happy to go on if there's questions about some of the others. And then certainly there's educational challenges. Both buildings were built uh, with an open classroom design, which means that you can hear uh, ambient noise from other class, not ambient noise, just noise from other classrooms, excuse me, uh, because the walls don't go all the way up to the ceiling. They're not permanent walls. 
uh, and there's incredible number of accessibility issues. You know, we recently, last week, had uh, a firm come in and do an accessibility audit on our district and all the schools. And at Wildwood, there are 33 areas of noncompliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. At Fort River, there are 29 areas, and some of these have easier fixes than others. So we, we have significant issues in both buildings. Again, not, I'll, I'll avoid belaboring the point because I think um, this has been discussed. I'm happy to answer questions about it, but I do feel like there's an urgent need to be doing something, uh, and I'll talk about that something in a second, to improve the conditions for our students and our staff. So this, this survey's, sorry, this is a little not centered, um, but the survey uh, was, it's now five years old, but there was a statewide survey given to all um, educators, um, all teachers in Massachusetts, and the statement it was had many, many uh, categories or many prompts, and the one that with the physical environment of our classrooms and the school supports teaching and learning. Across the Commonwealth, 83% of teachers agreed with that statement. Uh, at Crocker Farm, 93% of teachers agreed with that statement. At Wildwood and Fort River was under a quarter at each site. So our educators, to the point that the chair made earlier and, and Ms. Fay's uh, letter indicates, are telling us that our current situation is not working uh, for themselves to be educating um, our wonderful students as well as they should be educated. So I know one of the questions I get quite often is, you know, can't you just, you know, do fixes around the edges and, and see if you can improve the situation? And the reality is we can to a certain extent. Um, so on the left side, you can see this slide is indicating some of the concerns that can be addressed with significant capital funding, but short term. They don't need a building project. So the roof issue, which I talked about, you know, each of the roofs will be over $2 million for Wilder and Fort River, but that money could be spent and we can have new roofs on those buildings. Uh, the exterior doors are, many of them are original to the building and they just don't open. So from a safety situation, it's a major factor. We're replacing about a third of those this year in the capital budget and we've proposed replacing the last two thirds next year. Uh, Univents or HVAC systems, we can make improvements. We had a major issue this year with our HVAC system failing at Wildwood for the first two weeks of the year. If you remember the weather in late August, it was unbearable in air conditioned settings, let alone non-air conditioned settings. There was just no cool air coming out at Wildwood. Uh, these systems are failing on us. They can be improved. Uh, ADA access, we know some of those can be improved in the cooling I spoke about. However, there's significant numbers of issues that short-term capital funding can't solve. Our open classroom design, the fact that there um, are multiple classrooms without walls that have to interact with one another, um, not by choice, but based on the lack of acoustic privacy. The classroom size, so the for recent uh, or the current Fort River feasibility study, the architects did a nice job looking at not the, just the classroom size that it looks like on a grid, but how much is usable. Because of the quad design, the open classroom design, significant parts of the classroom have to be used as hallway spaces. So if you're in the back quad, you have to have space for all the students to get to the bathroom because that's the only bathroom. If you're in the front quad, you have to have a hallway for students to get to the back quad to get to their rooms. And they found most of our classrooms was about, were about 650 square feet. Uh, the average MSBA, what they would recommend is 950 square feet. So they're incredibly undersized in a usable way. Uh, right now, we're spending lots of money on inefficient energy use, um, which is bad for the environment. It's also bad for taxpayers in terms of the money we spend. That can't change that quickly. Uh, the safety of the main entry I spoke about, the ADA access, some of it, you really, the open classroom design doesn't allow for full use of, of the bathrooms for students, no matter what we did, unless we really changed that. And that we have many classrooms without natural light. And you know, while that may sound like a perk to some, there's actually a significant amount of research that talks about the benefits of natural light on all people, but particularly young students and their learning. These are problems that can't be solved with short-term capital money. They really need an MSBA project. We, we want to be conscious that we are uh, going to be good stewards of the incredible generosity of the Amherst taxpayers. Um, we have heard from the town manager and other town officials that MSBA funding is needed for us to take on any project, that um, we can't just take on a school project without some grant funding which covers roughly half the cost. I want to be really clear that there's many other capital needs in the town and the last thing that we want to do, I want to speak for us, is to pit project against project. You know, so I've been saying this at school committee meeting, this isn't just for the town council. Everywhere I go, I was at a school this afternoon. Um, I do not, talking to teachers, I don't want schools to be pitted against these other projects in town. We are aware that there are significant needs in other town departments. We work closely with those other town departments and we wanna work, continue to have a good working relationship with them. 
If we think about two sequential projects, in other words, doing one school than another, um, MSBA has told me that the average school project right now is taking five to seven years. Um, so if you play that out times two, in the best case scenario, getting in, finishing a project, getting in again, uh, that's a lot of years, but it also ends up being a lot of money. So escalation right now is roughly 4%. Um, so every year that goes up well above inflation. So that second project is 20 to 30% higher in the best of scenarios, um, which is millions and millions of dollars. Um, we also, as I said, have an inefficient energy use that we'd like to get better both for the climate and climate justice, but also for the bottom line of what we're paying. Um, and it would cost more. So one of the things with the net zero bylaw is that you know, we know that geothermal wells, for instance, is something that we will have to look into in any project. That's a big ticket cost. That's a seven digit cost. And doing two of those, right, there's some economy of scale that makes huge implications for cost. All that to be said, I feel the urgency that we do something as soon as possible, and I want it to be cost effective for the community uh, within the constraints that we have. Um, we also have significant capital costs that we've talked about multiple times at the school committee. Um, some of those need to happen now, and some of those could be deferred if we knew we had a project to replace both buildings in the next couple years. So just a little bit of history. So from 2007 to 2012, the district applied multiple statements of interest. That's basically applying to the MSBA for grant funding uh, for Fort River and Wildwood, and none were accepted over that, that year, um, six years actually, uh, span. 2013, the MSBA accepted the statement of interest for Wildwood. We then were in a building project that never received all the local approvals to proceed to construction. And last year, we applied for statements of interest for both Fort River and Wildwood. That was signed off on by the, both the school committee and then the, the select board. And neither statement of interest was accepted. So um, being the concerned superintendent I am for why we weren't accepted, I've had multiple phone calls with the MSBA. And they've been very clear um, that for us, we need to have consensus. They need to have consensus from us. And they're asking us for a little more than they would usually ask for most communities in the statement of interest. Most statements of interest, and these are all online and publicly available, are very dry documents unless you're an engineer uh, or designer or something like that. What they're asking for us is to come together around at least a framework of how we might approach things, what we want, what we don't want as a community. They don't expect us nor want us to have all the details worked out. That's what the MSBA process is for. That's what the feasibility process is there for but they don't want us coming in with no idea what we wanted. We've been in this as a community for many years now, and they want to know that the community has come together. And let me speak a little more closely about consensus. What they're looking for is either unanimous or darn near close unanimous votes of the school committee and the town council on a statement of interest that includes, includes more information than usual, as I was saying. It includes kind of roughly how many students are going to attend a school, and are we replacing both schools? or are replacing just one school. Um, I'll get into a little more detail on those specifics in a little bit, but the town council plays a very central role in showing consensus for the community. You're responsive to your constituents. So uh, as part of that, the MSBA wants to know that you're hearing support and then are feel comfortable voting, uh, given that support in the community, voting affirmatively to move forward the statement of interest. To put even a finer point on it, I said, well, what if we can't get there, right? And the response was, well, maybe you ought to wait till 2020, very bluntly. So MSBA is wonderful at being blunt and clear. Um, and so that was the feedback I got. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm talking quickly because of time and not looking at Ms. Ordonez, which is a mistake. Um, so the opportunity for me. So right, the, the timeline is that we need to be accepted, uh, we need to excuse, um, excuse me, we need to apply um, and by April 12th, 2019, and I'll get into timeline again at the end. So they, again, they need to be formally, statements of interest need to be formally voted by this body as well as the school committee and signed off on by the chair of the school committee, the superintendent, and the town manager. So this is what we shouldn't be talking about. We, certainly the community can say whatever they like, but we shouldn't be talking about in terms of having decisions made, whether new construction or an addition renovation project is preferred, right? People have lots of opinions on that. That's wonderful, and that would be part of the feasibility process. A defined site that'd be the right one for the school. Again, that's required part of the process. Who the architect should be, or detailed building specifications, or a complete educational plan. Those are things that a group that would have a member of the town council, a, a building committee that would have a member of the town council, would have a chair of the school committee, uh, superintendent, staff members, community members on, on with an architect and owner project manager, 
those are the decisions that that group would then be working on, solicit feedback from the community. The MSBA is not requiring us, nor would they want us to make decisions on those topics so soon, because they're really going to be informed by the work of a feasibility, a building committee. However, they are looking at us to have a vision of what we want um, and perhaps clearly what we don't want. So you can see that there's four points that I'm suggesting would be in a vision statement. The first being high quality learning environment for all students, no surprise there. Second is provides reasonably, reasonably maintainable buildings. What do I mean by that? Right now we are adding staff um, to our buildings to take care to either custodial or maintainers to our schools, not because our square footage is so great, it's because our it's because our buildings actually require them. They are so difficult to maintain. It is, there are so many things that go wrong so frequently that our ability to do any proactive planning work is quite limited. And so our schools right now are an example of, of not maintainable buildings, even not even describing the challenges that teachers and students are facing, just the amount of money that we are putting into maintaining buildings uh, and the human side of that is significant. And we want to have systems that our staff can manage and work with. The third is a point that I've raised, shared in public multiple times even before this proposal came out, which is, uh, I guess, a hope for commitment that our community would address both buildings before our current kindergarten students leave sixth grade. I think it's the quickest, reason, most reasonable timeline that we could have. I'd love it to be tomorrow. That's not a realistic scenario. Uh, but I think about waiting, uh, think about the young kids and what is our commitment to them. Uh, another way that someone in the community shared this with me is, could we commit that our, our children born in 2019 never know what an open classroom is? Depends on how old your kids are, whether that's relevant or grandkids. Uh, but um, I think it, it addresses some of the same, same elements. And, you know, again, to restate a point earlier, we want to be fiscally responsible. None of this is going to be inexpensive. I'm not pretending that it is, it's, going to be, um, it's going to be easy. But we, there's more expensive and less expensive ways to do this, and we want to be conscious that there are other competing demands in town. You all already are starting to hear them, I am sure. So the five agreements, and this is, again, what I'm looking, you know, proposed to the school committee for uh, try to take to the community and see if we can build consensus about. So the first is that one MSBA project takes care of both buildings. The second is it's a warm, child-centered building. Right, so that sounds perhaps cliche, but I've been in a number of buildings over the last five years in other communities for a whole host of reasons. And some buildings you walk in and you could feel like, I am a child in here. I shared an example at the school committee meeting. I won't go into as much depth at the school in Connecticut I visited. And the first thing I felt like as I was eight feet tall because the building was so centered around the age and literally the size of young students. Um, it was kind of like this huge tree, faux tree in the front when you walked in and you forgot that you were inside the building with the light coming in. Uh, there was no, uh, it was all natural materials. There was no plastics in the hallways and there was no Rembrandts or Van Goghs. It was all student artwork dotted all around the building. So um, I think this community really values that. They want that community feel. Our schools really don't have that now, frankly. Um, and we'd want to make sure that we did that. The third point would be that approximately 600 students. I want to be clear, and I'll, this is a foreshadowing to the next slide, but uh, our current schools, if you combine Fort River and Wildwood right now, would be about 745 students. So this, this is going to involve some other shifts. But one of the pieces of feedback we've heard loud and clear from the community is that there's some concern that 600, 700, 750 students was too large, even if you made it into two co-located schools. So we're trying to be responsive to that feedback. I also want to say we've received feedback from many folks who say both schools have to be taken care of right now. So um, I know we'll, we're engaging in this feedback soliciting process, but we've received many, many emails on this topic long before this PowerPoint was put together. Uh, the fourth point would be K-5 to K or K-6 schools. So that was a point of contention for many in the community around grade configuration. And I want to say publicly it's not me espousing uh, a viewpoint that one is better than the other about the prior project. It's a practical reality that we need to build consensus in trying to take some of the most contentious parts of the prior project and find a third path. There's people who really felt like the prior project was the perfect project. There's people who felt the opposite. I don't believe I can convince either side that they were right or wrong, and that's not my goal. It's can we find a different way to think about this and work through this. Um, this is a little more than the MSBA was asking for in terms of including all of these pieces, uh, but I feel like even if the MSBA isn't requiring it, we need to have it to build consensus here. So I'd like to go above and beyond a little what they were asking for 
because I think our local, um, to build a consensus locally, we're gonna have to. And the last one is that community surveys will be completed during the feasibility process prior to binding decisions. At that point, we'll have architects, we'll have owner project managers, we'll have a tremendous amount more information to, um, to in, both inform the community and gather their feedback uh, on exactly how we want to do this, both in the building design and also some things on the next slide. Let's see if this works. I don't know why that's doing that. That's okay. Um, so, um, to, to my prior point about building consensus, um, for, student, for 600 students is a familiar number to us. In the late 90s, both Wildwood and Fort River were both over 600 students. When I got to Fort River in 2001 and starting my career as a teacher, we were well over 550. Um, these are familiar numbers. We know this works well on the site. We know we can, we can do that. Um, I do, I am sensitive, and I've spoken before about, you know, 400 to 500 is kind of a nice skies. There's some evidence about that in a school. The reality is we have a dual language program coming in that by its definition will have to be a sub-separate program um, because the students stay within those two classes throughout. So we think about cohort size, which matters a tremendous amount to me. In other words, how many classes per grade level would there be? You know, there's roughly looking at three to four on the English side and then two on the dual language side in this model. That's three to four is what we have now at Wildwood. It's not a, it's not a change for our current model. Um, also, these models of schools roughly this size that have dual language programs in them are very familiar. I visited one in Harrisonburg, uh, Virginia. Little thing here shows it. Arlington, Virginia, Madison, Wisconsin, some of our partner districts in our Minority Student Achievement Network. Their dual, dual language programs are, are strands within larger schools uh, in a similar size to here. So this is a familiar process, a familiar size, and uh, something that I feel like we can, uh, we can do very well. Um, how do you get to 600? So there's a number of different ways. We could think about moving sixth grade to the middle school. There's a study ongoing. Our first public meeting was last week on that topic. Build an addition at Crocker Farm. Look at the seven through 12 consolidation. That's also being studied right now. Uh, if one, and then hence one elementary school can move to the middle school. If regionalization with Pelham occurs, that could have some implications. All that's to say there's a number of ways we could get to 600 students. We're not gonna figure those out by the time that statement of interest is, is submitted, nor should we. That should be part of this process, the feasibility process that kicks off if we get the grant. I also wanna note that the social equity benefits that are so important to many in our community also can be, would have benefits in this model. Reducing to two enrollment zones would decrease the number of students with special needs who are currently bused outside their neighborhood school zone. And also we could look at East Hadley Road, which has a very um, divided enrollment um, zoning. Uh, if you look at our map, we have little islands of uh, students who attend multiple schools to achieve socioeconomic balance. And we could do that a lot better with two zones as opposed to three. So again, what, 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 we're bringing to the, what I'm bringing to the community is can we support one project, one building, taking care of both of our schools, approximately 600 students, K-5 or K-6, and how we'll ask for it, I'll, I'll do a little bit and then I'll turn to Ms. Ordonez uh, who will add more. So we've already started listening sessions for staff at the first one at Wildwood this afternoon. Uh, the other two schools will be this week. In the larger community, which Ms. Ordonez will talk about, there's an Amherst Media segment that's a condensed version, similar to the timing of this, I hope, 15 minutes, I can't watch the clock, but uh, the Amherst Media one's 15 minutes and that's out on social media. Uh, we're looking for eventually feedback requested electronically to all to increase the access. I reach to our parent guardian organizations and my weekly update, but I'll turn to Mr. Ordonez to describe this in a little more detail. Thank you, Dr. Morris. So um, we had heard from our committee a couple of weeks ago when we had met uh, an interest in uh, bringing in a neutral facilitator to help us with our listening sessions, which you know, seemed like a pretty good idea given uh, a lot of the concerns in the community from you know, having people who are party to either one side or the other in the previous project. And so we are currently um, in the process of signing a contract with a facilitator who has done this kind of work before with other communities, um, both around Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, he is not from this community and is somebody who came with a lot of um, you know, very good references for facilitating, but also for mediating, which we thought was a, an added bonus. Um, and uh, really the goal of these sessions, so Dr. Morris had outlined for the school committee uh, a total of nine sessions. So three of them really would be for educators, staff in the districts, 
uh, in the district, excuse me, and then six others for, you know, three for parents and caregivers and three for the community at large. And since then, we've actually thought about um, having it be more of, you know, sort of six sessions more broad um, that, that, of course, you know, aim to bring in parents and caregivers because we think that they're going to have a very strong opinion about, uh, you know, what's happening in the schools and also have a lot of important feedback to bring in about their experience and their students' experience in the schools, and we want to hear that, uh, but also provide an opportunity for the wider community to engage around this topic. So a lot of voters who would have taken a position uh, on the previous project um, to hear them out and to also hear what, what they have to say. And so we're hoping to be scheduling those sessions. Um, we, you know, we're in the process right now of working with this, um, this facilitator to schedule those. So we don't have exact dates yet for that, but are hoping to do that sometime during the weeks of February 26th through March 8th or so, because we want to make sure that we are cognizant of both our schedule at the Amherst School Committee for uh, you know, making decisions, providing enough time for the community to promote these sessions and to get the word out once they're scheduled, um, and then also provide provide enough time for this facilitator to prepare a final report, which is something that's going to be coming back to the community that includes um, a lot of the feedback that will be, have been heard during these sessions. Um, and as Dr. Morris mentioned, also we are, I'm sorry, he actually uh, just uh, videotaped a segment which we then are going to be packaging in the form of an email that would be going out to all the different networks in, this, in the, the uh, district. Um, so utilizing PGOs, utilizing you know, people's personal networks, pushing out the email with a link to this video segment um, as well as a PDF of the presentation that is being shared tonight and a feedback form. Um, we don't want to call it a survey because we're not looking for quantitative data, um, but really what we're looking for is an opportunity for people to be able to express their opinions and their thoughts on this process and on this proposal if they can't make it in person to these listening sessions. And so um, it's really just, you know, kind of a, a not so gentle nudge, I guess, to, you know, encourage people to have their voices heard and to share their thinking with us. Uh, so all of that information will be collected um, and shared back with the community. And as Dr. Morris mentioned before, we've had a lot of conversations around consensus and what consensus means. And we're not looking for unanimity. This is not about everyone has to agree on every single little detail of this proposal. This is really an opportunity, I think, for all of us to be leaders in this and to be able to say yes to something, right? And you know, I, I know that I don't need to, to say this to this town council. Um, because all of you have shown that leadership in, in even getting elected to this body. But in, you know, I think that uh, this is an opportunity for educators, for, you know, um, you know, for parents, for caregivers, and for all concerned voters to be able to express that leadership and be able to say we can move towards something and be able to move towards a proposal that helps us get our kids in schools within the next five years or six years, as Dr. Morris said. So I'll, I'll close up. Just quickly, so uh, we'll assume positive uh, results, and after the MSBA lets us know, um, actually it comes back to you, to the town council, um, because there's a funding part. They fund most of the feasibility study. Last time it was 68%, but not all of it. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, there'll be a town council that's a required member of the, any building committee that moves forward. And that group would look at all the options, right? So I put on some, some options on the prior slides of how to get to 600 students, and there may be more out that we gather. Um, this is, I don't have the market on op ways to do that, and, and so we'll, we'll solicit more. Uh, and then make decisions. Um, I'm going to skip over that piece because I think it may come up in the discussion, uh, and I'm concerned about the time. Um, lastly, just in terms of a proposed voting schedule, so um, school committee will discuss this a bunch more times. These are approximate dates. Um, and looking to vote on March 11th because the school committee in our discussions wants to make sure that town council has enough time to deliberate on the topic before they take a vote. Um, so we tried to backwards design this of when we needed to submit it, giving it reasonable amount of time for both this body as well as the school committee. Uh, we don't actually hear from the MSBA until about seven months later, just to put it out there, uh, or eight months later. So December 11th of 2019 is when the MSBA board, board, board votes on which districts have submitted, which have submitted at student uh, statements of interest are accepted into the core program. And then, uh, again, with my optimistic mindset, then, you know, the fund really starts. Um, so I think to summarize, it's trying to build consensus to apply for a grant. This is not the end-all, be-all on exactly what the building's going to look like, 
it's going to be new, right? All those other things. And, and I think one of the challenges that, we're, that I'm facing in discussing this publicly, and I imagine you may face as well in your roles, is how to describe the grain size of what we're looking for. We're not looking for all the fine, tuned, fine details or, you know, I get a question to staff, uh, the staff, staff member asked me today, well, what about, you know, is that, you know, and I said, I don't know. And I think I feel very comfortable saying I don't know because even if I had an opinion, it's actually not the time for it. The time for it is when we're in a feasibility study with a diverse group of stakeholders formed as a building committee with an architect and owner project manager studying all options. Um, it's can we get there? That's the big question right now. So with that, I'll, I'll close and see if you have okay. questions or comments. Um, we'll move to questions in a moment, but I do want to mention uh, two things. First of all, uh, this is a very appropriate, if you will, kickoff of um, capital and capital projects that the council is beginning with. Next month, we will actually start looking across all of those capital needs as a council. Uh, and also, the second thing is that last week, following up on my very immediate suggestion that the town council would like to help in any way, um, <laughs> Paul Bachelman and I sat down with Mike and Anastasia, and uh, we actually came to a tentative agreement that we would work with the schools by using our opportunity to convene uh, district meetings that we are required to do anyway, and that many of us have been wanting to do and having the schools be part of those district meetings. And then we come to the issue that, but we don't wanna be the ones answering the questions because we're not the educators uh, in this case. So in what we are trying to do is during that two week period of intense listening is to set up three of those meetings. We would have to combine two districts in one and two districts in another and schedule them in such a way that after about an hour and a half to two hours of a facilitated conversation by a professional facilitator, not by the town council, but them gaining input from the audience and from the attendees. Uh, then afterwards, town councilors may decide to go ahead and do like another hour of their own district meetings as well. Um, we're hoping to nail down a schedule and work with each of you. I sent you a description of some of those ideas earlier today. Um, and uh, with that though, I think it's important to open this up to questions. I will tell you that this is my second time listening to what the MSBA process is. Um, it's not an easy solution. <laughs> it's not an easy process, but please let's open it up to questions. We are not taking a vote this evening, nor are we doing public comment. We will do public comment on this when it comes to the council on March 18th. Okay. Questions? I'm sorry, Mandy Jo. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, those of us that attended the MMA meeting could not actually see your initial one because we were out of town. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to come here to give us a shortened version of it. Um, the five agreements slide, I know right before that you made a point of saying the, the MSBA is not looking for things like um, educational plan and some of these other things. And I look at the five agreements and I see K5, K6, which was something I know that in the last process was, was a discussion and a decision made per an educational plan decision. So I'd like you to speak more to um, not necessarily why that's on there, but how that doesn't contradict what the MSBA is looking for at this time. Yeah. So, um, and I've kind of, uh, as a, as a disclaimer, um, I've had multiple conversations with the MSBA, even you know what I put out publicly, because I'm conscious that they're a state agency and uh, they want to. If they're telling me things, I want to make sure that they're comfortable, so that when I say them in public, that they're happy that I'm saying them in public. And so I think in our particular situation, um, what I express to M the MSBA and the representative I speak with frequently is that. I do think without this in writing in a statement of interest, I think 
my belief is it'll be hard to gain consensus in the community. This is an issue that people feel really passionately about, um, you know, in one way or the other, right? It's not that there's only one side of this one, there certainly is not. And so when I express this to the MSBA, their understanding, having worked with us prior, that we may provide more information than they're requesting. Um, you know, there's also relatively small scale implications architecturally, whereas some of the things on the earlier slide, like new construction versus ad reno, not to pick on that one, but there's like, right, that's a, that's a construction decision. That's a, that's a little different than a, a much, what's more clearly an educational decision. So uh, they also appreciated the fact that it's not saying one or the other, right, that there's actually still some flex in this for the community to talk about. So it's, we're making kind of one of two decisions, but it's, it's narrowing the scope of the grade span. It's not actually saying it's exactly K to six. And so they were comfortable with that. Pat, your mic. With the change uh, to K-5, would there be more opportunity for preschools, preschool students in both of the schools? It's a great question. Um, one of the things we're exploring right now, I'm trying to think if this is getting off the scope. So um, I'll, I'll say succinctly that uh, that's unclear. That depends, that would be a design decision and a community decision whether to do that and we're actively in this, uh, there's a small presentation on this at the last school committee meeting, looking at perhaps partnering with um, Community Action, which is the head start in our community, because there's a dire need for preschool seats, and there's a number of ways you can do that, and so we're exploring all avenues. Kathy. Um, I want to follow up on Mandy's question about the K-5 through K-6. Um, as I was canvassing, one of the issues was, are we going to keep the grades together? And people, a few people have looked at this slide as saying, is that firm? Is that no matter what, you know, whether it's K-5 or whether K-6? So that's a question. Um, then the second question, and you've answered it on the next slide on how will you get to 600? Um, there were a lot of questions um, on, and positive and negative reactions on the idea of sixth grade moving. Mm -hmm. um, so that seems to be a, an issue that people are going to care about for me as a representative to know, you know, which direction are we going, even if it's not firm. And the seventh and eighth moving up and having a whole building available. Um, so I'm, I'm asking probably three questions in yep. one. Are there costs involved in that? Can you just move seventh and eighth into the high school and then suddenly there's a whole building available? So the first is is the K through five, K six, a solid, yes, we're going to do that. Whether it's five or six, we're going to do that. And then are you leaning in a particular direction on how to get to the 600? And if so, which, the seven eighth, is that feasible or should that be taken off? Sure. So on the case, it's okay to, I don't know if you were. Mm -hmm. So on the, I would imagine that these agreements as written, you know, or at least my proposal would be that these are actually in the statement of interest. So not like, I pledge them, but I'm not gonna write them down. You know, the district's responsibility is to produce the, the statement of interest, the, the elected officials is to approve or not approve it, and so these, this is what I'm suggesting we would actually have written down, committed in the statement of interest. That's the first question. The second question, in terms of leaning, um, I have thoughts on that, but actually what I'll say is that my thoughts aren't, I'm aware that of my role. Um, but I think, like all of these things, we would need more information. You know, so uh, I, uh, I th think it's worth saying that we should explore all of those. I think all are, you know, viable. And then that's the piece that I feel like when we're in the feasibility process, really hearing from the community about which is the best path forward, you know, in terms of the ways to get to 600. To the last question, in terms of seven through eight to the high school, um, we actually, so that, project just started that was funded by the regional school district and our, we had our first public meeting on last Thursday and would need to build an addition at the high school to make that work. Um, whereas for sixth grade to go to the middle school, our initial scheme, this is not a finished product, um, showed some potential to not need building an addition to make that work. Um, just the difference between sending 150 students to one school versus over 400 to another school you know, it really taxes the available space at the high school. Those aren't finished, but those are the initial drafts and those are public documents, so I feel like I'd share that. And, you know, we'll be, um, any other additional questions people have, um, 
I'm happy to share kind of what's now public documents that have been shared about, you know, some initial sketches on that. Andy? Yes. Um, Dr. Forrest, could you tell us to say just a little bit about how the Fort River feasibility um, work fits into the large, this project that we're discussing tonight? Sure. So uh, it's not complete, but close to complete. So I think there's a number of things that we've gotten uh, as takeaways from the Fort River feasibility project. One is we know tremendously more about the site of Fort River. Um, we knew a lot about the site of Wildwood because of the prior project. And so that's been useful and incredibly useful information. And if we do move forward, uh, some of that initial work to understand the site at both, you know, both locations, that work is completed and we'll have a better sense of that. The second part, second thing I think we've gotten is that as we've explored the net zero, this has been sort of the trial run of what net zero would look like in a school building. And so we have uh, lots of discussion and, and um, information about what that looks like, what the cost would be, and different ways to achieve a net zero, the net zero bylaw that um, town meeting uh, passed last year. So um, there's other outcomes I could talk about, but in terms of major implications on a future project, those are two that, that I feel like are critically important. And if I can just add, um, regarding the Fort River feasibility study, uh, so, you know, as you know, uh, town meeting had approved a feasibility study a couple of years ago to, as Dr. Morris mentioned, uh, get more information about the Fort River site because the previous project only dealt with the Wildwood site. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, questions and uh, really, you know, I think just people wondering sort of what could be feasible uh, on the Fort River site. Uh, there was some conjecture that had made its way around because we didn't have that information. So this is an opportunity for us to learn more about that site and be able to understand, you know, if we were to proceed with a project, and that's a big if because there was no project actually currently in the works. Um, if we were to proceed with a project, that would actually then um, provide at least basic information about the, you know, the, the, the land itself, um, the building itself, a lot, just to answer a lot of open questions that we had from previous, but it's beyond that, mm -hmm. um, it's not directly tied to this proposal in any way, and I think that there's been some confusion in the community about that. Yes, Dorothy. In the, uh, the proposed 600 uh, student school, if there's 20 students per class, is that the idea that's 30 classes? Which, if it's a K through five, that's six grades. Um, so that would be five classes per grade. And I was not too sure how the dual language worked in that. Sure. So the dual language piece would, would cover two of those five classes, per sec two sections per grade level, and that would leave three sections to be um, sections that are taught exclusively in English. Shalini? So when, one of the concerns I heard during the campaign was uh, people complaining that uh, they did not hear about the meetings and so forth. Is there something we can do differently this time to ensure that everyone um, you know, who is interested and affected can participate? And one of the suggestions that has recently come up in our district meetings was to have focus groups in the different communities where people are, rather than expecting everyone to show up at our district meetings, but to organize uh, meetings where people are. I can start if you. Sure. So um, I think that's a great suggestion. We've done that before. We've been, gone to the different, um, particularly communities where transportation is more of a challenge. Um, and I think there's some success there. I think, you know, not every place has a, a central location. So if it rains, that can be problematic. Um, not every, um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. But I think it's a good suggestion. I, I do think some advantages we have right now is there's a lot of community interest on this. Um, and I, don't, I, I think people are paying close attention, uh, both in terms of press coverage, social media, and otherwise. And I think the more that counselors and school committee members, I don't want to task people, but the more that you can be sharing some of these pieces with your networks. We now have a nice system, I think, in my opinion, of uh, a nice network now of people who can share with their constituents, get feedback. And that's really when we think about what the chair stated before about you know, making them district meetings. To, to weave this into existing infrastructure, or emerging infrastructure, I should say, uh, about how do we communicate with the constituents of Amherst. Um, and I think that has um, high potential to have more people part of the process earlier on. 
Uh, we certainly, with the school committee and this, the district, have been sharing this widely, um, whether it's superintendent newsletter or social media accounts, um, and we've already gotten lots and lots of feedback from uh, a great number of people, and it's still not enough, right? We're not getting to everyone, and so that's our effort is how do we, how do we expand that circle, and we'll need a lot of support from, from elected officials like yourselves to assist us in that. And just to add to that, I think, um, you know, my, my earlier comment about the email that we want to blast out and, you know, and combine that with the video segment and the, the feedback form um, is an opportunity to reach several thousand people here in town simultaneously. So I think that combined with earned media, you know, press um, and, you know, our social media, as Dr. Morris mentioned, and all of our circles, uh, both town council and school committee, I think we can you know, pretty uh, easily reach most folks who can be reached around something like this. Probably not everyone, but you know, uh, a large percentage. Dorsey. I just wondered if um, it, it would be possible to send a mailer to every household. Um, that way you would be able to reach everyone. It feels a little bit like the process that's set up is if we're just relying on people's networks, it's not, you know, it would be nice to be able to say that we contacted everyone. The thing that I have to think about, and I'm hesitant to say because I'd have to check, is whether we can use public funds because there's a potential vote based on it um, as a district. So that's something I can absolutely look into. I just don't know the, I honestly don't know the answer. It's not to say that's not a good suggestion, but I know that there are, there are rules around elections, and while this isn't a public election, it's still coming to votes of both the committee. Um, and so I will look into that. It's a really good idea to think about and to figure out the logistics and the legality of it. Kathy. I just want to follow up on it. If I don't know the issues, but um, if it was a flyer that was glossy and showed here are some choices that we've looked at and here are some reasons why pluses and minuses, and here's a reason why we got to this. It's less one idea. Mm -hmm. It gives people more a sense of what else is potentially on the table or has been talked about rather than this is the only thing. Um, so I just, you know, we're, I'm, we're going to be getting questions anyway, and so this, you know, sixth grade moving, does it have to be 600? Right. How slow or fast could we get a second school if we did two small ones? You know, right. those kinds of questions. I'm just trying to address things that you know people will be asking right. in bullet-like things, not, not dictionaries. <laughs> Sarah. So I just wanted to follow up on that idea. I'm not really sure how we would reach every single resident, like a direct mailing seems like it makes sense if it's legally viable, because I wanna make sure that, you know, when we talk about consensus and we're saying that, you know, it means that the school committee unanimously says yes, and town council unanimously says yes. I wanna dispel sort of maybe an idea that would come from that, that here's our idea, we're gonna give you a listening session so that you can listen to us talk about it, we're saying we want feedback, but this is really the plan and what it, consensus means to us is that school board says yes, town meeting says, town council says yes, <laughs> and you know, that we are still, like you said, like you said, that it's up to us to listen to everyone mm -hmm. that's in our district. So I'm, I'm just gonna put that right out there because it probably seems obvious. Yeah, I think that um, the, the challenge that we have is that we don't have a lot of time. And so we are trying to find, uh, again, this is a consensus for an application, you know, not for an actual final project, right? There's still, even if, if the MSBA were to accept this application in December, there would still be a very long process involved to actually come up with a project that would involve, by necessity, the community's input and feedback over the course of a couple of years. And I think what we learned from the last project is that you know, people feel very strongly about any project that's going to come up um, for very good reasons. And so you know, I, don't, I can't imagine under any circumstances that if we were accepted by the MSBA, uh, that our application was accepted, that we would not be able to solicit feedback um, at that point for an actual project and get the input that, that people want to give. And so 
right now what we're trying to get to is a place where people feel comfortable enough with some general parameters. We're not looking for you know, any specific details around any project. Um, we want just you know, to, to put down some general parameters. Can our community actually get behind some concepts, which is what Dr. Morris has put forth, and then we'll figure out the details later during a feasibility process. And one of the things that our committee has talked about quite extensively is this concept of a survey and what that means, right? But it's also about making sure that we're setting up appropriate listening sessions and that we're doing that at the appropriate time um, when we actually have a project in place and we know that we're moving forward with something. Because then at that point, you know, we have more or less, um, you know, both the, the MSBA uh, standing behind us with a commitment for money for a project, which we don't have right now. Um, and we also have a timeline under which we will be working to be able to, you know, get that input and feedback from the community so that we can move forward and begin construction on something. So we are still a very long ways away from that. Um, so really what we're hoping for here is just, you know, can our community get behind these parameters? Do we feel, um, you know, in, in that this is more or less reflective of our values as a community? And if we can say yes to that, then we can make a commitment that we're going to get as much information and hear as many folks as possible to move forward with a project. But, you know, but there's a lot, a lot of steps still involved before that. Let me... Um, provide a perspective on this that um, it's possible that nobody in this town council has actually been here uh, in any leadership position when Amherst built a building because the last building we built was the police station. And so what I think is ahead of us as we look at both this project and any other project is understanding the building process mm -hmm. and the fact that you start with a, what may seem like a lot of money, but in fact a smaller budget that actually allows you to plan. And that allows you to come up with, okay, what are you handing over to the designers to actually design? And then they move that, and now we're talking big bucks. Now we're talking the millions of dollars to build the school. All this application does is get us, we hope, several hundred dollars that we as a council would then add some additional money to that allows the town to go forward in a thoughtful planning process to actually come up with the plan for the school. And then once you do that, then you can actually go to your building design and that's when the MSBA, we hope, comes forward with many millions of dollars and we have to decide how to raise the additional million millions of dollars so it's a it it's not a once and done and not all the answers are known now they're known as you go through the process um this was one of my painful learning experiences on dpw fire <laughs> um so just to understand that this is just that first step it's to get the plan to plan Yes, George. I just want to be very clear, and I'm perhaps speaking more to my colleagues than, than to anyone else, but my understanding is that we're being basically at these listening sessions and these mm -hmm. gatherings that we would be involved in, we're being asked to um, basically support these five principles. Um, you don't expect this to change. Um, so these are listening sessions. But and essentially, we are um, making the argument for this proposal, and that's our goal. Is that the understanding of my colleagues? I'm not saying we're ready to make that decision mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a body yet. We haven't, but mm -hmm. what we're being asked, right. I think, is uh, to right. go forward and, uh, in a sense, be salespeople or representatives for this proposal. That's and it's listening, yes, but we're trying to convince people of something. We're not just starting from scratch. Right. But convinced through listening. Yes. And convinced through understanding. Yes. And some of that understanding is what's most important as, you know, we then go on to the next phase. Yes. Alyssa. 
So if I could phrase this a, a less gentle way, it is this plan. There is not going to be a color flyer that says, well, if we did two schools separately, it would work like this. That, that's not on the table. That's not going to get a majority. That's not going to get a consensus. What's on the table is, and I appreciate what's been said about, you know, we're going out on a listening session, but are you really listening? I mean, you got one plan. I, I don't see three plans here. I got one plan. Blah, blah, blah. What does it matter what I say? But it does from the standpoint that is this going to be workable? There are sacrifices no matter what we choose to do. This is not a perfect solution, just like two schools is in fact not a perfect solution, and even if it was, we can't afford it, period. End of story. There is not going to be two new renovated schools. If there are people on this body who disagree with that, who believe that there can be two new buildings, I'm sorry, you're wrong. We don't <laughs> have that money. We will never have that money. So the choice that you're making, if you say this isn't something I can get behind, is piecemeal renovation to limp along until magic falls out of the sky. Because literally, this is the choice we are facing. And so I, I appreciate that we do need to figure out, though, how to talk about this effectively, because we are not trying to sell people on something. We're trying to say, we understand this plan may have some shortcomings, that you're, you have concerns. We have concerns. I'm a little edgy about those 138 students that we're just hoping happen to move away at some convenient time, so we don't have to deal with that, um, especially given the sizes we have had at Fort River and Wildwood during times when Amherst schools were incredibly well thought of. Talk to older town meeting members. Their kids had a fabulous experience in the schools, much larger schools, much larger classes, many more choices than we've been able to offer for a long time now. So things were really good back then, particularly when the new building was newer, but still difficult to work around. So I, I think we just, I mean, maybe we need to discuss this more as a group before we go out and start having these conversations, right. because if there are people here who say, well, you know, I really have a lot of constituents who want there to be two buildings, and so I, I can't support this, then we, need to, we can't go in with mixed messages. Let me also add to that, that as we move into next month, and we look at the total set of capital projects and some of the projections and even the finance committee started looking at old projections. Uh, the reality hits the road real fast in terms of both what can we as a town afford and what can we expect our taxpayers to bear. So, it's, thank you. Could I? Yes. Is it possible to, um, so I just wanted to say that um, if it's any consolation, I guess, to, to this body, we have been getting a tremendous number of emails and uh, messages that have been sent to us from all sides of this, the previous project, including from leaders on, on all sides. And um, I think that the, at least the early responses to this proposal have actually been quite positive, which has made all of us, I think, I can probably say that, uh, optimistic on our mm -hmm. school committee mm -hmm. because we weren't, uh, quite frankly, that optimistic before. We weren't sure if we could get to a point of consensus. And so I think what Dr. Morris has proposed uh, sounds, you know, somewhat doable for, for folks. And again, I don't, we're not going to work on all the details. That's not our calling now with this application. But the fact that we have a lot of folks, you know, from various positions around the previous project saying to us, this feels like something that we can actually endorse and get behind is, uh, makes me feel good. Kathy. Um, I, I just uh, want to uh, take off a little bit on what you just said, Alyssa. You know, if it is a fact, and we have cost estimates that say one, with a full costing, because if one big school is going to have some traffic reconfiguration, if we had to add to Crocker, if we moved some kids to Crocker and had to build, it would have some cost. So an honest best yeah. guess or, or ballpark versus one and then another, where one and then another of small schools would be a lot more expensive. I think we can't just assert that is a lot more expensive. It would just be good to have a fact sheet on it that, that people could look at it and say, let's look at these two just as a behind. Because it's otherwise, people are going to say, are you sure? <laughs> You know, have you really looked at the larger set of costs with a 
helpful. He, you know, you know the timeline is longer. So I think it's just a helpful thing rather than asserting that that we can't afford two, we can't afford one. Letting people see it. Yes. So, so I'll, I'll share my cognitive dissonance with with that thought um, respectfully. Is that any time you put a cost estimate out, that assumes certain decisions have been made, and our community is savvy enough to know. For instance, the Fort River feasibility study, right, which is looking at there's a there's a, a enormous range between five or six different options that are presented right now. Multiple, like, top of my head, I think it's like twelve million dollars, you know, ranging from like sixty to forty, right, and so. The numbers are huge, and so that's the concern, is that you put out numbers. A, people remember it. You said this was only gonna cost X, and we decided we wanna make it net zero, the most net zero building possible, and the community says, we agree with that, and there's a cost to it. So, so that's my caution. I think the things we know are that buildings, short of a, like a Great Depression, buildings will get more expensive, right? There's a long, I mean, all these are things that if, you shoot me an email, I'm happy to respond to. The MSBA has a graph, really nice on their website, of cost escalation over time, since the beginning of the MSBA, right? So it's not like my word or, you know, Mr. Donas's word. You can actually see how projects get more expensive over time. You can see that that's actually, the escalation has escalated over the last two years. And, and it's not, you could look, they have actually like little icons uh, where you can click on the project and find out more information. So every project in the MSBA queue over time, you can see how it gets more expensive. And we can send a link to Yeah, we yeah. could send a link. I'm mean, trying to capture all the things. Um, so I think that's the challenge of, of quantifying it is then I'm making decisions that are a building committee's decision. And I feel really uncomfortable doing that because once I put a number out, I've made, I'm like, oh, well, someone's going to say, well, that's an ad reno. And I'm like, mm. So I think that's, I desire the same thing as you. I just think the process to get there, we will regret a few years from now. The other piece that is often not considered when people start talking about one building versus two is the operational costs, yeah. which is every year, every budget. And that's people and costs of building. So I hope we keep that in mind too as we have this conversation. Further comments, questions? Shalini? Could we get a timeline? Maybe it might be helpful for everyone on board to see when, at what point, who can get involved, like what is, at what point the town council is playing a role, at what point um, the, the residents have a voice, and then also following up on George Ryan's uh, comment, um, the, George Ryan, George's comment. Um, I wonder if you want to rephrase the session from being called listening session to something else, since it seems it's more about giving people, yeah, information session, which is giving people information of, and, and I guess it's, I mean, it, I guess just to clarify what the goal is, it's to share the process, where we are, why we're doing what we're doing, and, and, and maybe listening as well to some degree, but I, so the timeline piece we certainly can share um, about the points of intersection between count council, town council and the process. Um, we've talked about that a little bit, yep. we just have to write it mm -hmm. down. I think in the listening session, um, I mean, Mr. Ardenas, Mr. Donez may have other thoughts. I mean, I think the challenge is it is authentically a listening session in that uh, if we don't get to consensus, if what we hear in the listening session is uh, people really wanting two thing, one of two things that's not being proposed, that really matters and then the school committee and myself and probably yourselves will have to really reconsider our next steps. Uh, I don't wanna presuppose that there's gonna be consensus. I agree with Ms. Rodonez. I've received positive emails and support from people who either agreed with some of the district's work in the past project and not, but I don't, I don't wanna make an assumption that that's gonna be the case and the goal is really to present some ideas, have folks you know, work on it and really like think like, what about this, what about that? And to you know, both hear the feedback and also generate ideas that we want to consider you know, if we're fortunate enough to get into a feasibility project. So I don't know if that, you agree with that, but. Yeah, I, I think I would, I would just add that um, this is also something that we talked about at school committee level. Um, you know, the, the stark reality is that if the community is not ready for consensus, we can't move forward. You know, the state agency has been very clear with us that uh, we must be able to show that we're ready to move forward with at least, again, those parameters or some sort of general guidelines. So if the community is saying, we're not ready because we're all over the place, then we're sort of dead in the water at that point. 
So that's what we're hoping we can avoid, and that's why we want to listen. We want to hear what people have to say. If there really is that kind of contention still at this point, um, we need to understand why that is and try to figure out how we can move forward in, in all of this. But what none of us really want is a repeat of where we were before. I don't think any, and we can't afford it. Our community absolutely cannot afford it. Our kids and the educators and staff in those buildings every single day cannot afford to be put into that position year in and year out. And as Dr. Morris said, these buildings are not getting any younger. They are just continuing to show the signs of wear and tear. And this is not an overstatement. I mean, for anyone who's been in those buildings for the past couple of decades, you understand how bad these buildings are getting and they're not gonna get any better. And so we cannot afford to go through the same level of divisiveness and contention that we had before. We actually do need to come together as a community and at least embrace the opportunity that we have here to move forward with an application. And I hope we can get there. Dorothy? Dorothy, um, I just want to say I appreciate the way that you're going about this. And I have a positive feeling that we may have a way forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other, yes, Andy. Yeah, I just uh, want to conclude with your going back to your very last slide in your deck. Um, the uh, goal that we need right now is to get consensus between the school committee and this council about submitting a proposal this year a statement of interest to the MSBA and the end date for that of the date it must be submitted April 12th is a known commodity so as we're talking about all these processes we have to remember that it all has to fit within the schedule that's here right. yes Sarah this is going to sound contentious after we just said everything, but I, I really do want to say that I appreciate all of the work. I think the town does need to move forward. I think we all do need to pull together. I think that's all of us want that. I just want to just make it a point. Just in it, I was an English major, so this is just a language thing. Um, I do think that we still need to listen, even if it's like you know some things come out about well here's this plan, but this is what we want to do going forward. I, as a representative of a district, in no way want to say this is what we've decided and we're selling it to you. So although I, I totally agree, we need to put this out there, we need to get behind something altogether, I just wanted to say that some of that language, I, I don't feel comfortable just leaving that hanging out there. So. Other questions? Yes, Pat. Um, I think the facilitator is going to be really needed. <laughs> and I'm delighted that you've thought of it. I think it's a wonderful idea. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes, Alyssa. I wonder if in preparation for those plans, one of the many, many things that you will no doubt be producing is really something I have been feeling unable to answer enthusiastically about what we learned from Fort River. And I did hear all the words that were spoken, but it was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And people need to feel comfortable that that money was spent wisely. We will continue to spend money wisely, but what that actually got us, because a lot of what's been out there in the community has not been particularly easy to digest for the people who aren't part of the everyday and haven't been attending those meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Both Thank you. of you. I know this is just the beginning of this discussion, but it's been a very informative beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you for your partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to take a five minute bathroom break. And then the question is, what am I going to do next? Because I wanted to go into executive session at 8.30. You want to go? I wanted to do executive session at 8.30. Oh, what, what's the topic of the executive? Or... Oh, of course. Okay. Hey, Peter, we're done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
We are going to reconvene, if you will, please. We are going to actually begin. We're going to begin our discussion, actually, of the uh, action item number two, the Energy and Climate Resilience Committee. We're going to do that after the um, executive session. Okay. So, give you a moment to make sure you're. All pulled up your documents, etc. All right. Uh, first, so we are going into the Energy and Climate Resilience Committee. I know that there's actually a proposed new name. Uh, we will not be doing public comment during this period since we did that the last time. I th although I understand that many of you in the audience are quite interested in this. Uh, we first discussed this item on January 7th. At that time, it was referred to the Governance, Organization, and Legislation Committee. Following two meetings, actually three meetings of that committee, where the discussion focused on form, content, and organization with respect to clarity, consistency, and actionability, the sponsors of the committee charge submitted another version, which is the one that will be proposed this evening. We will begin this section of the agenda with a report from the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, and then move to the motion. So, Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, I r wrote a memo on behalf of the committee um, that indicated our two meetings. Our third one was actually this evening at 6 p.m. because our prior meeting had not seen the final version of the charge. Um, yes, we were referred to, the, this charge was referred to the committee to look at, as, as Lynn said, the form, content, and organization with respect to clarity, consistency, and actionability. The committee was not tasked with considering any substantive changes, any substantive, or any desired substantive changes from anyone. We were strictly looking at technical matters. So you will notice, and, and as I speak tonight, that a recommendation here is not a recommendation on any substantive matters in the charge. I mean, it is simply a recommendation on the technical matters of it. it. It is one of the reasons the committee itself is not making the motion tonight because we were not tasked with substantive matters. So we, at tonight's meeting, the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee, um, by a unanimous vote, found that the Energy, Climate, Energy and Climate Resilience Committee charge that has proposed a renaming, we're, we're using both for consistency stake, sake for searching in later documents, to the Energy and Climate Action Committee charge as presented by the sponsors and I believe that what they will be presented tonight but as presented in our packet um, is actionable. And, and at the same time the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee makes no recommendation on that charge with respect to the clarity and consistency at this time. The committee itself has made no recommendation because in our two and a half, I will say, <laughs> technically three meetings, we did not have enough time to come up with guidelines um, that we would like to see with charges for clarity and consistency with regard to form and content and all of that. And so we didn't feel as a committee we could make any recommendations to that because we don't have anything to base it off of, a recommendation off of. So that's the reason there is no recommendation there. Um, at this point, I would say that's the extent of our report. I will might ask to be recognized later on depending on what type of discussion we are having um, for any other potential guidelines or recommendations that the committee has. So I'd ask that you recommend, recognize the sponsors. Okay. Um, Darcy and Evan as the sponsors. 
just want to introduce um, a representative from the um, Amherst Regional High School uh, Environmental Action Club, Saho Lee, who came with some others who had to leave already. And they have left a statement that some of you have in front of you. Not everybody has picked up um, from the club. So thank you, Saho. Uh, so I'm going to um, just uh, go over some of the main changes that were made since uh, we met last. There were a number of counselors that made suggestions and uh, we incorporated a lot of those suggestions into the new uh, revised version of the charge. So um, I'm going to move through them from the, from the least to the most important ones, in my opinion. Um, and then I will get to the motion. We're going to be talking about five main changes. Um, first of all, you heard that the, the name of the committee was changed from the Energy and Climate Resilience Committee to the Energy and Climate Action Committee because there was a little bit of confusion about the word resilience and um, um, action covers both mitigation which means greenhouse gas reduction, and climate adaptation, or climate resilience, which means climate adaptation. Um, uh, secondly, um, we eliminated the institutional sector from the list of um, town sectors covered by the committee charge. Uh, and that was because um, the institutional section, sector is really impossible to include in the goal section of the charge uh, since UMass has climate goals mandated by the state and its own climate action plan seem too confusing. And uh, though we do want to take advantage of UMass expertise, um, it wouldn't be ad advantageous to have um, representatives of the university and both colleges because that would take up three of the seven resident slots. Uh, number three, we uh, added waste reduction to the list of possible um, projects that could be taken up by this committee. Um, it's a natural topic to include, um, though it does contribute very little to the town's greenhouse gas emissions if you don't count the contribution of consumption in general. Um, number four, uh, the deals with the composition, the composition of the committee. Uh, diversity is encouraged in the new committee charge, um, as suggested by counselors at the last meeting. Um, though you may note that the charter already does that. Uh, this committee is intended to be a working committee with a membership that has a high level of experience and expertise in climate action. Um, it's expected to hit the ground running without need for educating membership. This is the, the important point that with regard to experience and expertise, the, the charter is determinative. Section 3.3C states, in making appointments, the town manager shall seek to appoint individuals with relevant expertise or experience. The town manager shall establish policies and practices to actively encourage a diverse pool of applicants for multiple member bodies. So in fact, the town manager is required to look for people with experience and expertise in the relevant area. Uh, the required areas of expert experience are related, the, the areas that are listed in the charge, um, the suggested areas are related to the sectors where we have the most greenhouse gas emissions in town, in buildings, transportation, and energy.
With our three colleges and a multitude of related departments, the Hitchcock Center and several zero energy buildings, Amherst has many, many qualified people and quite a few who are clamoring to be on this committee, including people from all sectors of the economy. Experienced people will be discouraged from joining if they think this is a discussing committee rather than a working committee. Um, okay, so number five. Uh, the 90-day goal-setting requirement is retained and is now in the order. Um, so it was in the charge, now it's in the order. Um, the short-term goal-setting was moved to the order as a result of the action of the Governance Committee. Uh, the, that committee uh, did not want to set the precedent of having both long- and short-term goals in one committee charge. Retention of the environment. Energy and Climate Action Committee's goal setting requirements for climate action that have now been publicly aired will signify that Amherst is serious about taking action about reducing emissions. We have a 90-day timeline because the climate crisis is unprecedented, the gravest challenge ever faced by humanity. It would be hard to find a comparable situation that presents such an emergency. I hope the insertion of a short timeline for this committee to produce goals will produce will be a source of pride to future generations that we acted with urgency. Municipalities, states, and countries all over the world have already set goals. As Rudy Perkins said in his extremely well-searched letter to the council, and Rudy is right here, <laughs> With its long tradition of intellectual and cultural leadership in our state and its strong base of educated, forward-thinking, and inventive citizenry, Amherst has a responsibility and the capability to play a pivotal role in overcoming the crisis. The goal setting required in the committee charge was changed so that, that it's not policymaking or prescriptive, as some counselors had suggested we do. Because we already have, as a town, resolved to source our energy from 100% renewable energy and within that, 100% renewable electricity. The addition of other greenhouse gas, quote, will give the committee the flexibility to come up with other alternate goals, such as that of carbon neutrality. Um, it's possible that the committee will decide that they don't want to go 100% renewable uh, renewable energy and they would rather go with carbon neutrality. So this would allow that flexibility. Uh, the Compact of Mayors framework, which, is, which our town has been working with through our sustainability coordinator, is based on towns going through a process to set goals for carbon neutrality. There are pros and cons to each and the committee would have the flexibility to look at that and come up with new goals. I realize this is a lot. We need to set clear dates and firm targets for our greenhouse gas reductions and make a step-by-step -step plan to reach those targets in order to meet the challenge of the climate crisis. As noted in our last meeting, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently concluded that substantial reductions would need to be made in the next 12 years to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. In short, to avoid extreme climate impacts in our world and our community, we don't have much time. Again, Rudy, uh, quoting Rudy, in terms of interim goals, there are a number of towns who have come up with 100% renewable electricity by 2030. So there is growing consensus around climate goals of something like 100% renewable electricity by 2030, and 100% net zero in all sectors by 2050. These goals are achievable if this work is launched immediately and in earnest, but can tolerate no further delay. Our town, our children, and their children are counting on our, your leadership in this crucial task. So that was just to tell you what changes we made. Now to the, to the motion, unless Evan would like to say something. I'll, I'll keep what I say short. Um, so 
this document uh, started as a collaboration between Councillor Dumont and myself, um, and at that point represented the vision of two councillors. Uh, on January 7th, we invited our colleagues on the council and the public to offer uh, their input and their vision. And over the past two weeks, uh, we have worked to incorporate the comments we've received into this new charge. Uh, Darcy gave a, a very specific list of the changes we've made, um, but overall I would say that the changes were made to try to make this not the vision of uh, two councillors or the council itself, but the vision of the community uh, that will be tasked with implementing this charge. Um, we work to, to uh, work in greater flexibility and adaptability in the charge and hopefully greater inclusivity and engagement of the public. Um, so I look forward to uh, hearing from my colleagues uh, how we did <laughs> at incorporating their vision uh, so that when, uh, if this passes, um, hopefully, tonight uh, what we have is a charge that isn't, has come a long way from just the vision of two counselors and is instead a vision that represents the entire council and the public uh, that we're here to serve. So thank you. Climate change is a global emergency. The 2008 Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act acknowledged the urgency of climate change and setting climate statewide goals for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. The 2018 United Nations International Panel on Climate Change Special Report underlined the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels and urged strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change. The 2018 National Climate Assessment provided an in-depth look detailing the multiple ways climate change is already affecting and will increasingly affect the lives of Americans to each area of the United States. And the 2018 resolution to create a House Select Committee on the Green New Deal addresses the threat of climate change by setting forth an aggressive plan to move the United States to renewable energy economy within 10 years. However, recent inaction at the state and federal level on bold climate proposals highlights a need for local action. Amherst has a history of recognizing the challenge presented by climate change and meeting it with action. I am going to leave out that part because we went over it last time. Yet, Amherst has a long way to go to achieve ambitious climate action goals. It needs to be taking bold action on climate and establishing itself as a municipal energy and climate leader. I move, therefore, that the Town Council order the establishment of a standing committee, Charter Section 2.5, called the Town of Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee, to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals, and order that the Energy and Climate Action Committee, within 90 days of its first meeting, Submit to the Town Council for adoption initial recommended target dates, benchmarks, and or interannual targets to achieve the climate action goals adopted in Article 16 passed by the Fall 2017 Special Town Meeting and other emissions reductions goals recommended by the Energy and Climate Action Committee that the Town Council act by voting to adopt the recommendations submitted with or without amendments within 90 days of receipt from the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Pat, I'm taking lessons from you. Um, there's a motion, do we have a second? Sarah has seconded it. And we're now open for discussion. The, what we are discussing at this point is the motion, but that motion also involves the charge. Mandy Jo. I, I guess I have a clarification and then, and then a request. Um, mm -hmm. The motion seems to have two things, two actions. Um, so I guess my request is, could we split those up for discussion purposes? And then the second one is 
the motion is ordering the establishment of a standing committee but doesn't discuss the charge at all, should the motion really be to adopt the charge of the ECAC committee instead of order the establishment? That's, that's more of a procedural question since it doesn't really even mention the charge at all. It just says we're going to establish one but doesn't say how. So the, f the first of the two motions, one was to order the establishment, and I believe you're suggesting a friendly amendment in this case, and that is to adopt the charge. Okay. Is there any question on that one? It, it, was, it was a question as to whether the motion to order the establishment of a standing committee called this actually adopts the charge that is in front of us or just says we are establishing a committee but we haven't just decided beyond guiding the meeting that of what its content would be. Andy. Staying just on the procedure for the moment, yep. um, they're both they're two complex documents that have a lot in them, each of which may have discussion and it could be significant discussion. It therefore seems to me that going through a motion that has just been placed before us to establish the committee and let us talk about the aspects of that motion and whether there are any amendments we want to make to it and then vote on that before getting into the charge and treating the charge as a separate document allows us to focus on each document without confusing the two. And then the third item, which is actually the reporting order of the Energy and Climate Action Committee, is yet a third discussion? I'm just clarifying. Well, my opinion is that that's part of the motion and that's one of the reasons why it might be advisable to take the motion separate from the charge to the committee. Okay. Kathy? I just want to second that idea because I think about them so separately. So rather than linking them here, the charge then goes into a lot more detail and we're being asked to look at pieces of it. So I, I'd like to they, they read to me differently. Okay, which would you like to do first? The charge or the motion to create? I would think the motion. The motion? the motion? Okay. All right, so then we're going to go with the first of the two items. And I wanna ask the change of that for someone to read the change of that. Mandy Jo, you had a change you were suggesting. I was just suggesting a procedural thing. I think we just decided that, that what Darcy just read is not the adoption of the charge that's in front of us, but just the adoption of establishing a committee and then saying that within the first 90 days of its meeting, once we establish it, that they, the initial recommendations are there. And then there would, I presume, be a second motion after this one is passed to adopt the charge. Okay. How would you like this first motion to read then? I, would I think there's no change, right? Okay. So the motion on the table is to order the establishment of a standing committee, Charter Section 2.5, called the Town of Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee to guide the town in meeting its climate mitigation and resilience goals. We're going to discuss that first. Doesn't it also include the order that the energy and climate action, both, both sections? Okay. I thought I heard that somebody wanted to separate the motions. I yes. had wanted to separate the discussion of the charge document itself from the... Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so then the second part of the motion is to order the Energy and Climate Action Committee within 90 days of its first meeting to submit to the Town Council for adoption, initial recommendation, recommended target dates, benchmarks, and or annual, inter-annual targets to achieve the climate action goals adopted 
in Article 16 passed by the Fall 2010 Special Town Meeting and other emissions reduction goals rec recommended by the ECAC and that the Town Council act by voting to adopt the recommendations submitted with or without amendments within 90 days of receipt for the ECAC. Discussion. Alyssa. I want to do a really boring thing and then you can all talk about the substantive parts. Um, I'm, I would really prefer that we take out the reference to 2.5. 2.5 is general powers. It's got nothing to do with creating standing committees. And I think that when you put 2.5 immediately after standing committee, it makes it seem like, ooh, that's related to something. We have general powers. General powers are great, but I don't think we're going to want to quote them in every single thing that we do. And so I would, as much as I love citations when they're specific, this is such a blanket one. To me, it makes it seem like it means more than it does. And reflecting back to something Mandy Jo said earlier about the governance committee, because we don't have, as you saw when you looked at the many, many charges the select board provided you, that we do not have any template on what a charge document should look like. We have some ideas of the best of those, but we don't have one. Um, one of the problems with that is we also don't know what to call things in terms of types of committees. And I'm a little leery of calling this a standing committee because the only place the word standing and reference to committee appears in the charter is in regards to committees of the town council being standing or ad hoc. So just as, so as not to create further confusion, I understand that we don't yet have a word, so maybe you know governance can come up with a good word when we get to the charge itself, but that word is also in this motion. And so taking the word standing out, which I know would make the charge more awkward because then it would have a blank space, but it, at the, the point is the whatever is not ad hoc is what we're looking for, but since we are very specifically saying this is not a standing committee of the town council, it is a permanent committee, it's an ongoing committee. If you want to use a word like that, fine. Otherwise, I say it can be, just like 2.5, it can be lifted out of this motion without damaging this motion, and in fact, decreasing future confusion. I'd like to stay on that particular topic. Is there any objection on the moving the, or eliminating the reference to the charter? Okay. All right, then the next question is, is eliminating the word standing? It's just to create a committee. You gotta say something besides yeah. shake your head. Um, <laughs> I think that's a good idea in, in, in trying to parse through what we call things. I noticed the memo we had with a legal opinion on the difference between a committee of the council. Um, they called that a committee of the town Mm -hmm. So we, I think we could find out a simple way. We've got a bunch of them in town that aren't committees of the council. So that may be too many words, but if it's a committee of the town, it's not a committee of the council. You know, I mean, just okay. something simple. So eliminating the word standing, is there any further discussion on that? Yes. I'm fine with that. But um, also uh, just want to say uh, that the governance committee has been discussing uh, this and uh, did come up with a solution that perhaps would be more appropriate to discuss um, in the charge uh, about what we call committees and how we differentiate between them and charges. Uh, so I think that in that context, the standing might not be problematic, um, but that it might be premature for that discussion since we're not on the charge yet. Uh, but I also don't think we lose anything by eliminating standing from this motion. Okay. So at this point, we've eliminated standing and we've eliminated the reference to the charter. Is there any other discussion on this? Of the whole motion? Yeah. Let's start with Andy. So I'm going to return to an issue that uh, Darcy actually did respond to and one that I raised when we discussed this the first time. But to preface that, before I get into it, I want to um, thank Darcy, Evan, and the others who have worked on this. Um, this is a critical issue confronting not just Amherst, but everybody. And, but we do need to do our share. We need to do our share appropriately. And uh, I'm appreciative that we're moving forward as we are. 
However, um, I am concerned, was concerned before, and still am concerned about the um, need to make sure that our community is with us and that they understand what they, uh, what we're suggesting, what the committee is developing, and have a chance to really participate and ask questions. We've had several emails that um, went to the entire um, council, and I'm not gonna quote any of them directly. Uh, I, they're probably all gonna be in, in packet eventually if they're not yet, but, um, there was several that expressed um, various levels of concern about the impact on various parts of the community, whether it be the business community, the cost to homeowners, the cost to the agriculture community of um, adopting goals. And uh, I want to make sure that we have a process that is able to fully engage anybody who has concerns within the discussion and feels that they have had an opportunity to be heard and um, have their questions answered. If we run ahead of too many people in our community, I think that we've done some significant damage to ultimately the goal that we're trying to achieve in establishing this committee at all. And for those reasons, my proposal in the last order would be to remove the sections that refer to specific deadlines because I think that the committee itself can create its own deadlines and will have its own sense of urgency and doesn't need the council to put the urgency before it. I think it will, have, it will know the urgency. I would therefore in the first sentence of the second part of the second thing called an order suggest removing the words within 90 days of the first of its first meeting and then at the end um, eliminate everything after the ECAC that um, so it's almost so removing the words and the town council act by voting to adopt the recommendation submitted with or without amendments within 90 days of receipt from the ECAC. Um, and uh, I really uh, firmly believe that those changes will not weaken this uh, creation of this committee and in fact will strengthen the committee by making sure that the community has the opportunity to be um, involved and feel that they were involved and not feel that we are working under some kind of an artificial pressure that we've put on ourselves. Are you making that in terms of a motion? I will make that as a motion, yes. Is there a second? George. We're now discussing the amendment to the motion. The amendment is to remove in the second order the words within 90 days of its first meeting and to remove at the very last of the statement the words and that the town council act by voting to adopt the recommendations submitted with or without amendments within 90 days of receipt from the ECAC. Discussion. Darcy. Just to give you a little context, um, the original version of this motion was actually had the goals in it. <laughs> Our, I, the first time around, we were contemplating the possibility of just putting the goals out there to the town council. 100% um, renewable, uh, renewable energy by 2050 and 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And um, through our process of thinking this out and wanting to make sure that we did give people more time, um, we put it, we revised it to its current language. Um, 
And as you heard me already say once, um, the, the process of coming up with goals is not going to be that difficult. Um, and I, some of you have probably seen in the, in the council packet that I shared a spreadsheet of comparing goals of other Massachusetts communities. It's a pretty s straightforward, simple process. And you, if you notice in the column with goals, in the column with interim goals, they're all very similar, um, what these different towns, towns have come up with. So um, my point is, it doesn't take that long to do, and it would be possible to have a public process within that 90 days, just like the school committee is going to have a pretty big public process in the next 90 days. Uh, so we could also have a public process um, that involves a forum or listening sessions or whatever. Additional comments? George. My concern is, is not with the goals per se, it's really with the time. And uh, it may turn out that in 90 days this will happen. But I have concerns that we're putting pressure on this body that hasn't even been created uh, to get something done right away. And um, I think everyone is aware of the urgency. I certainly am aware of it. But um, I want to give this committee the chance to make up its own mind and to present its findings when it's ready. Um, and I also understand the desire for urgency. So I'm caught between these two. Um, but I share Andy's sense that taking this out does not at all um, weaken this very excellent document, but actually can strengthen it. Um, but it does obviously take a little bit of the sense of urgency away. But I think that it would be wise to take it out and let this committee um, do its work and uh, trust it. Additional comments? Shalini? Um, I also just firstly want to acknowledge the work that Darcy and Evan and all the people have put into this and uh, also acknowledge that this is a great start for us as a uh, town council to be working on this. It's such an important issue and it's something that we all believe in. So I just wanted to put that out there. And also, I, I just want to put it out there that uh, I feel like it's your baby. It's, uh, you know, Darcy's baby and Evan's baby. And uh, any suggestions we make is seen as a judgment on your baby. And so not, it's not meant to be taken in that way, but uh, I'm hoping that any suggestions we make are because we really feel this is important and we want to make it, see it um, achievable and you know implemented. So that all being said, um, in terms of goals, I think the overall goals, like you said, have already been set by other communities. And I'm wondering if there are goals that might be specific to our community, like what are our specific vulnerabilities, whether it's related to flooding or you know what are specific areas of um, um, goal setting that we need to assess for our town. Where do we stand with that? What are our vulnerabilities? What are our uh, goals and intermediate goals going to be? And whether that's going to take some time as well. Okay. I'm sorry. I believe, Kathy, you had your hand up. Okay. I'm, I don't know whether 90 is the right number, but having been on working committees, it is really useful to have, we have to get something done by X date. Um, it means that the meetings are less prolonged. People don't feel like we're just having a chat session. Um, and putting the same onus on the council that when this comes back, uh, take a look at it faster rather than slower. So I, I think a number, what, as I said, I don't know whether 90 is the right one, and I'm just going, you know, where does 90 get us to? Does it get us to May? Does it get us to June? And if we want this in place, because this isn't taking action. This is just figuring out what our stretch goals are. So we, if we want to get something in place in 2019, um, taking six months to get there is a big chunk of time, whether it's seven. So I'm, I'm just arguing for putting some kind of target 
there. Um, we're not going to put people in jail, I don't think, if, <laughs> you know, if it turns out that they didn't fail, they, they got it back to us X days later. But I've worked on a couple places where we just didn't think we could get it done, and it turned out we did get it done because we had that uh, time, time. Evan, I believe you had your hand up. Uh, so first, I just want to build off of Shalini's comment uh, that whatever you say, I don't feel like you're judging my baby. Um, and I, <laughs> I hope that you all give feedback and are critical um, because we need that. Um, especially as a new legislator. Uh, one thing I just want to just sort of throw out there to think about, and this isn't arguing for or against the amendment. Um, so to some extent through the process of revision that we've engaged in, uh, we have made uh, a lot of the language, both in the charge and in the motion, uh, less specific. Um, and so we're looking for initial goals recommended target dates and or we do provide a lot of flexibility. And so the committee could come back and say really whatever they want. Um, and that could be several goals. That could be one goal. Uh, that could be an absolute goal. That could be an aspirational goal. Um, you know, I think there was an effort to build in uh, flexibility so that uh, even though that 90 day period is constraining, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to return this specific goal in 90 days. If the committee feels as though, you know, they can only really agree and, and, and go through a process of getting one aspirational goal by the end of 90 days, then that's what they can confidently return uh, to the council. So um, flexibility, I think, is key here. Uh, I do think that it depends on how we envision these goals should be set. So on the one hand, uh, we do have this document that was provided to us. It sort of lays out the goals from other committees, uh, other communities. Um, and if we're just going to say, well, they did it, so we're going to do it. Northampton did it, so we're going to do it. We can do that tomorrow. Um, if we want to have a more in-depth discussion of a goal that sort of involves, you know, greater planning, that takes a little bit more time. And so there's, there is a lot to think about here. Um, and so planting that seed into this discussion to think about how we conceptualize that 90-day timeline um, and how we even conceptualize what we expect from these goals. Steve. Um, I was just going to speak in favor of the order as written with the 90 days because I think it is helpful for possible committee members to know kind of what the urgency is. So I'm in favor of the order as written. Additional comment. Mandy Joe. So this is one of the ones I've struggled with in what to do about this timeline for reasons that Andy, Kathy, and Evan have just put forward of 90 days is really short, but what is the purpose of these goals? If, you know, what, when they're presented to us and recommended to us as a council, what information are we going to want this committee to present to us? Is it going to be, as Evan said, well, every other community's taken these because the I, M I P C C um, has made these those, so yeah. Or are we going to want information that says, we believe as a committee, you as a town and we as a town can actually meet these. That goes back to something George was saying, I think two weeks ago. Are these aspirational or all these, are these goals actually as a, are, as a council when we adopt them, are we, going, are we going to believe we can truly meet them? And it, I think, I'm not sure where we are and which one that would be. If it's we're going to want all the information to be able to tell the council when they're presented to us as goals that this committee believes we as a town can meet them during those time frames, I think that takes probably longer than 90 days because you need to figure out what this town is capable of. If there's aspirational, I agree directly with Evan, we could do that tomorrow um, and just say, sure, we've already done it with some other things. This town has already done it in the past, as stated in the preamble. So I, I'm struggling with that. I think it depends on what, we, what information we expect to come back from this committee and what we expect to do with it. So I'm hesitant to put 90 days if we actually want a goal that we believe will have information that says we as a town can meet that goal, whatever that recommendation is, because I'm not sure that can actually be done in 90 days specific to this 
town. Additional comments? Mark Darcy. Uh, I, uh, I hear you, Mandy Jo. <laughs> I, I think that um, the reason that these goals can be made fairly quickly is because there's a, 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 multitude, a multitude of unknown variables involved. And so to some extent, it is aspirational because we, we, we can't know certain things. We can't know what the political will is going to be of the state or federal government to act on helping us out. Um, uh, there's just many, many, we, we can't know oh, how the renewable portfolio standard is going to increase. We, we won't know a lot of things. So it does have to be, to a large extent, aspirational when the, um, when the committee comes back with goals. So that's why it's able to do it more quickly. Uh, and just to answer Shalini about uh, her concern about um, goals about our town vulnerability, um, that is a different area. And we do have a, a separate section of the charge that deals with long-term uh, goals around resilience. This, this short-term goal is only about mitigation, greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and it's very narrow. When this committee comes back to the council, I will want to ask questions like, who did you consult with? How many people from the community have you worked with? And I want evidence that this is something that the community has now developed greater understanding about because like many of you, I have received the same emails and many of them support, and I do too, climate action in very, very serious ways. But there are concerns about cost to businesses, cost to individuals, et cetera. So I'm gonna wanna know how these goals were vetted with the community in a way that the community isn't gonna be sitting in this room screaming at us because we just did something that they had no input on. Yes. I, th I think the, the committee will have a lot of help in being able to do that um, uh, from, for example, Stephanie Ciccarillo, because she's been working on this for over a year, uh, working with the New England Municipal Sustainability Network, um, and all the other communities that are doing the same type of thing, working toward carbon neutrality, and trying to do it in a way where each community doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, so that they can confer with each other and figure these things out. So um, uh, it's true that there are different things about our community, but I, I have faith that with all the work that she's done over the last year, um, that she will be able to, to help a lot um, by all of her contacts and all of the information that she's gathered. Other comments? So the question on the table is an amendment that would remove from the second statement the words within 90 days of its first meeting and also remove within its latter, the latter part of the statement the words and the town council acting act, I'm sorry, by voting to adopt the recommendations submitted with or without amendments within 90 days of receipt from the ECAC. You ready to call the question? So, uh, I'm sorry. The, the motion is to amend the motion. <laughs> it's an amendment to the motion. That's what we're voting on. Is there any other 
discussion before we go forward? Call the question. I think a roll call vote probably would be appropriate. Councillor Baumill. Abstain. Abstain. Councillor Brewer. Could we make sure we're really clear on what the amendment, the amendment is to remove the 90 days in both sections? Yes, it is. Yes. Councillor DeAngelis. No. Councillor Dumont. No. Councillor Greismer. No. Councillor Haneke. No. Councillor Pam. Abstain. Councillor Ross. No. Councillor Ryan. Yes. Councillor Shane. No. Councillor Schreiber? No. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Swartz? No. Okay, the vote is uh, three, yes. Eight, no, two abstentions. Okay, so the we are back to the original motion, which includes the 90-day deadlines. Is there further discussion on the motion? So we're discussing both parts. Both parts of the original motion. Just the motion. Not, we're not discussing the charge yet. Okay. The original motion. Yes, Darcy. Okay. I am perhaps confused. Um, the question of who can belong to the committee, is that what we can That's in the charge. Okay. So then, okay. We're not to the charge yet. This is just the motion to create such a committee. Just clarification that we standing. We took out the word standing and we took out the reference to the charter. Those are the only changes to the motion. And those were seen as friendly changes. Okay. Any other questions on the motion? Okay, yes, Evan. So one of the uh, things we've heard from people and one of the things that um, Andy and uh, our president brought up was, you know, wanting to hear um, from the community and what did people say? How was their uh, stakeholder input in this? Um, so one thing I think it would be useful for us as a council to discuss is uh, given that there are, I know we're not on the charge yet, but given that there are parts of the charge that do require um, community engagement, but that, uh, which would be 6C if you have the charge in front of you, um, but that that engagement not include goal setting, uh, do we, as a council, feel as though um, the order as written would sufficiently include stakeholder engagement and public participation uh, so that when these goals do come to the council and our president does ask the committee, who did you talk to, how did you get to here, uh, that, we will, that they will have that information? I'm putting this out as a question, not as a motion. Excellent question. <laughs> Kathy. Um, as I understand what Evan just said, I think if we want to have that type of backup, it should be put in the charge. You know, that we can find the sentence we need that says, you know, and 
shall come back with evidence, with arguments that they've done with the community, that that's a description of how the this group is going to act. It's not what they're trying to get to. So I, I think this can stand and then we can move to the charge. Other comments? Okay, let's um, take a vote and move the, where the motion before you is the one previously presented, eliminating the word standing and eliminating the reference to the charter and nothing else has changed. Uh, is there anybody feels I need to read the motion? Okay, uh, would you like to do an all those in favor? All those in favor. It is unanimous. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All those in favor, all those opposed, abstain. Thank you for that, Andy. Okay, we are now going to move to the discussion of the charge. Um, There is, we need a motion to put the charge on the table. I'm sorry? No, I'm asking for one. I so move. Okay, Dorothy, Dorothy moves that we adopt the charge to the Energy and Climate Action Committee, right? Yes. And second? Okay, Pat seconded discussion. We're on discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to ask that once a topic of discussion is brought forward, we stick to that topic and then go on to others. Okay, yes, Steve. So I'll start pretty near the top. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with the composition of the committee. So I, I have no problem with, you know, nine and two counselors. But I do have concerns about the specificity of the qualifications or the expected experiences of the other seven, the seven residents. So it's highly unusual, maybe unprecedented for Amherst committees to be all experts. Um, so if you can, for example, the planning board is not all planners, the design review board's not all designers. And it's highly unusual to have the experiences be so specific as this. So I'm not ready to make a um, motion for an amendment quite yet, but I just wanted to raise that as a concern that I think it should be much more general along the lines of something like it should consist of um, nine voting members, one of two of whom should be a member of the town council, and the remainder shall represent a cross-section of organizations, institutions, businesses, and interests in the town. So that, that's not a motion, but that would be something that I think we should consider. Dorothy. Um, I concur with that. I think it's very important that we have buy-in and understanding by a broad sector of the population. I, I do understand the um, frustration that some people feel when they, that's been stated in some letters of bringing people um, up to date, but I, I fear technocracies. I really do want a broader representation, including people representing different aspects of the community, but of course we would want a lot of people who are uh, experts in various parts. Yes, Mandy Jo. So I'm ready to make a motion. All right. <laughs> uh, um, so I move to remove everything after residents in the seven residents line, so that that line reads seven residents. Um, 
And Is I'll that, speak to that after it's seconded. There, it's, the motion's been made by Mandy Jo. It's been seconded by Steve. Further um, discussion? I share Steve and Dorothy's concerns. Um, I know this was something that was mentioned by a number of counselors at our last meeting about the specificity of the membership of the residents. As Darcy noted today, actually, the charter itself requires the town manager to seek expertise for specific committees anyway that is relevant to what that committee would be doing. Um, I don't think we need to set forth exactly what that expertise it needs to be in the charge. It can be done on a moving basis because right now the expertise might need to be in people who have experience with goal setting for reducing greenhouse gases. But in three years, once we've set those goals, that expertise needs to move potentially to resiliency planning and adaptation planning and people who have expertise and residents who have expertise in that wide variety of sectors and to um, pass a charge that constrains the expertise indefinitely, I don't think is wise. And I do recognize that you can always amend a charge. Um, but if we're intending to pass a charge for a standing committee, we shouldn't pass one knowing that in a year or two it would need amended. I think we should look towards the long term in what our charges should look like and should con contain. Additional comment. Alyssa. I appreciate the discussion we've had about this so far and what was just added about the constraining indefinitely, which is also a, a nice um, issue to be thinking about as we move forward. I appreciate that there are at least two different ways of viewing this, and one is you, you populate it with experts, and then you demand that they go out and talk with the community. That's what Section 6 is about. That's what several other conversations have been about. Another way to approach it is you include that community on it to begin with. I have to say that having, that's having discussed this a lot, I actually was leaning toward going with the experts because we have had many, many, many experiences in Amherst of, ooh, let's put someone with this incredibly creative way of looking at life on the planning board that doesn't have any interest in zoning. Um, and that's great, but it doesn't get the work of the planning board done. It doesn't mean the planning board shouldn't be listening to people when they come to their meetings, but there's something to be said, as we have seen, you know, basically the letters fell out two ways. One is make sure you include all these different perspectives, all of which are incredibly important on the committee versus have the expertise on the committee to be able to bring plans forward. And I think we make a mistake to say it, that doesn't matter, and it's absolutely not unprecedented, I will say. We have very specifically created, actually it isn't. We have very specifically created charges that said there will be someone with this level of expertise, that level of expertise, et cetera, on committees, but they've been more like working groups. And so, that's part of what we're looking at here too. And so while as much as I'm big on setting precedent and looking at structure, I think that it depends on what you expect this group to bring back. Because if you expect this group to bring back something fairly quickly, I think the expertise of all the members up front who are then also find the skills to reach out to various parts of the community, that's one thing. If you're expecting them to talk about making a master plan for over 10 years, then feel free to put everyone you want on the committee. Steve. I'm sorry, Kathy. I, I, Kathy was actually next. Um, I, I just want to build on this comment um, because I think we're, we're, you, you can't have it both ways. If you want to have in 90 days people coming back with something and you can push people hard on what's the evidence, what did you think through, how would we get that, then you have people who already have a lot of experience and have been bringing a field to this. I've been on several commissions that are more medically oriented and it was really important if we wanted to do achievable quality metrics for the U.S. healthcare system that the people on it said, you can't measure that. We don't have any science behind that. We do have some science beyond this. And because consumers, uh, all of us who want safe medical care, had a vision of things that could be done that the science wouldn't allow us. So I think 
being specific on the range of expertise that we're looking for is important. You know, I'm not going to say that this is exactly the right list, but I think it's important rather than saying, and it, it does say experience, so it could be someone has been doing this for a while and implementing it in a town and working with a co-housing unit to get it to be zero net, you know, thinking through the systems. Um, so it could be a systems thinker. It doesn't necessarily mean a t technocrat in terms of just the science field. Steve. So I have no problem with some expertise. So obviously expertise is essential for this. And I do think there's a huge difference between a working group and a standing committee. So a standing committee is going to be here forever. And as you were saying, that the goals, the goalposts are going to be changing. So the, the committee of the town, as I see it, is almost meant to be not exactly disinterested. They have to be obviously engaged, ready to, to you know, not skeptics of the subject. But I don't think they have to be experts. And we have lots and lots of citizens that are very interested in this, can connect the dots, but are by no means experts, especially in the, the categories listed. So one of the quandaries I have and you've, um, is that I don't think that this is the list. This is not a, this is a list that, um, you know, first of all, there's more than seven expertises there. So that's, that would be the, the roster right there, you know, in those expertises. But I think that there are large groups that are not there, like the planning community, like planners and, and um, people that are thinking, to me, the list is really slanted towards the STEM fields. And I think we need to think beyond the STEM fields or who should be on this committee. Shalini. So um, I'm citing the research of um, certain um, researchers in climate change and Beth Savin in particular from Climate Interactive. She's a PhD from MIT, I don't know if you know. And, uh, so in looking at, actually, I looked at her TED talk, and she sent it to me and uh, was uh, kind of shared her experience in that TED talk, which was that at United Nations, they, had, they were presenting their cutting-edge uh, analytical tools, and they presented all the data to all the countries that this is how urgent and important this, um, you know, this issue is. And they found, to their disappointment, none of the countries were willing to be on board. And so she struggled with that, that we have the data, and what do we need to do to convince uh, people to change? And what she discovered was that there are a lot of urgent pen current issues that um, people have, or countries have, or towns have, w in which kind of are seen as in conflict. And so where she ended up in her research was in coming up with multi-solving um, strategies, which, which requires that they're different, uh, you know, what, the investment we're making in solving climate change should also include how, you know, include the other areas that are being affected. Are we also improving other things? So we're improving health as well, or we improving, um, you know, how it's impacting um, the quality of life. And, and so the point of that, along with the other research that I read in combination, suggests that the more we're looking at this in connection with the other issues in town, with the other stakeholders in town, we are more likely to get the buy-in. We're more likely to move forward and to have really realistic um, and uh, and have strategies that will be implemented that will have the buy-in. So I am uh, very much in favor of having definitely some experts, um, and maybe we can define the number of that, um, you know, that we definitely need four experts in this area. But I do feel, especially in the third aspect of this, is listening to people during the, uh, during the campaign as well, um, they were doctors, there were startups, and there were parents of schools who were concerned whether we'll have the building with the net zero. So there were a lot of people who were concerned about um, what are the implications of these uh, policies on, you know, just um, their lives. So if you look at equity, we look at social justice, we look at business and our economy, we look at the environment, I think we need to 
look at all three of these issues in a way, and we can't just uh, focus on one narrow, looking at climate change in isolation. George. I'm imagining someone who cares deeply about this issue, and when they read this, they realize they need not apply because they just don't fit these seven categories. And I agree that expertise is needed, um, but we also need buy-in. And I'm concerned that people who want to be involved and actually could bring a lot to the table are excluded just by the, the very limited nature of this language. If we could somehow make it a little less rigid, I think we will get a better pool. Darcy. The, uh, if you look at section five of the charge, um, that is the section where we added Shalini's holistic and intersectionality language to try to reach out to all the different sectors to make sure that we do that outreach and where, that we are connecting with all the different institutions, with the organizations, with the staff, with the, everything, um, the climate justice community. And um, that doesn't mean that they have to be on the committee. And I think that I need to point out again that um, if you look at the charter, 3.3c, it actually requires that the people on the committee have expertise and experience. I did not know that until a few days ago. <laughs> Sarah. So just as a perspective of looking at this, I think you definitely have to look at what do you want this committee, like we said, to come back with. So one of the things that, that I have heard a lot about, and I'm just going to, I think consistency is something that I'm looking at like as, as we go forward with how we're thinking. Um, when we're thinking about schools, I think one of the things that I'm hearing is school committee, those people are the experts. They bring something forward to us and then, then we sort of work on it from there, right? So if you're looking at a committee um, that's going to get you, you know, very real goals fairly quickly to present to you and then, you know, you're going from there with it. I can see one of the things we first said about this committee was having experts on it would be ideal because, you know, it could hit the ground running and, you know, definitely know where it was going. So I think it, I think it largely depends on what you want this committee to do. Steve? Yeah, so the, for me, the, quest, the school committee is a great analogy because I've been thinking about that because the, and there were school committees elected officials like us, so their, their expertise is that they're able to get more votes than, you know. <laughs> um, but so they're not, there wasn't a seat for a teacher, a seat for a, you know, in other words, so, and so where the expertise comes from is then from either the regular staff of the, you know, of the school, of the, um, Amherst Public Schools, or from consultants. And for me, so one of the questions I have here, and somebody brought this up in a letter, one of the letters to us, is really what this committee would need is a, in addition to what we already have in town staff, probably a consultant. So to me, that expertise that's embedded in the membership should be expertise in other help that's given to this committee so that they, on behalf of the town, can make make recommendations. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Thank you. Um, I've served on three committees in this town. I've never built a fire station. I've never built a DPW. And I really don't know that much about net zero buildings, Chris. But you taught me a lot, <laughs> as did Rudy. Um, but what I do know is how to ask questions, how to look at what makes sense, whether or not definitions are understandable, and to listen to people like Andy on committees when he says, you know, 
when you write a bylaw, it really needs to have a section on definitions and so forth. And so in a space of two months, eight of us, four of whom are very, very knowledgeable about net zero, and four of whom were not, myself included, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't speak for you, Andy, um, sat down and over a period of 15 or 16 meetings, um, did a decent job of rewriting a net zero bylaw. And I think what difference happens here is when you put everybody on a committee who thinks too much alike, mm -hmm. you don't have anybody asking the difficult questions that somebody who is not from that background is going to ask. So I would like to suggest that in this motion, or that's on the floor, that we say seven residents, some of whom will have experience, mm -hmm. which leaves open the option of someone like me applying. Mm -hmm because I don't fit any of these. Pat. One of the things that um, is important to me is diversity, and in this sense, diversity of thought. And I'm looking at uh, forestry, and I know that Sugar Shack Alliance right now is in a big kerfuffle because um, some of the affinity groups don't believe that forests should be managed one way and other people in Wendell State Forest think they should be managed in another. And while we're, we're in a kerfuffle, what we have is creative tension. And it does seem to me that within this context of experts, there needs to be a range of opinion and understanding um, so that there is that tension. And I believe firmly that um, Sometimes we have to look to the person who knows the least, um, and I'm really putting quotes around that, because we're, we need to look for, we need to see from their eyes mm -hmm. for a moment to make decisions that are effective, to make collaborations, to reach consensus. Um, and I think that going back to the M, MMA, whatever the conference was we were at, um, the uh, opening speaker was incredibly important because she spoke about you can't change what you can't see. And so I really feel like there needs to be a range. I, need, I feel like the emphasis does need to be on expertise, but we need to open up that definition. Evan. Uh, I don't know how I followed that up. Um, <laughs> So as one of the co-author, original co-authors of this charge, this has been probably the part of the charge that I have struggled with the most. Um, I, I think that especially given the short timeline that we as a council just voted on, uh, there is a need for some expertise. And I think that uh, I can understand that we need a committee that is capable and that doesn't have to spend time uh, trying to educate its members. Uh, there's another part of me that also believes that the best committees uh, are not composed of all experts and that sometimes a group of experts in the room together uh, talking to each other doesn't always produce the best results and that sometimes you need stakeholders to, uh, as the president mentioned, ask those tough questions. Um, sometimes you need people who will be impacted to stand up and say, well, hold on, how, how is this going to affect me? Uh, Perhaps that could be done through public participation, uh, but there's also something to be said about the difference between merely consulting with a stakeholder and also empowering that stakeholder with a voice and a vote on a committee, um, and I think that that can be powerful. I don't think that we're talking about adding on just anyone who has an, uh, who has an interest, but people who have important perspectives, and so that's been something that I've struggled with as I've dealt with this committee charge for um, what feels like six years now. Um, and, and so for me, from my perspective, you know, I want to make sure that uh, the local business community is heard. I want to make sure that renters are heard. 
Um, and I think that that sometimes takes more than just having a public forum. And so uh, my thinking on this has evolved quite a bit over the past month as I've considered it uh, in depth. Um, and I think that there is some merit to saying that this would be a stronger committee that would produce uh, more innovative solutions, stronger solutions, and solutions that the broader community would have greater ownership of um, if it was not just experts in the limited number of fields. Um, that point one. My second point is not as long, I promise. Because um, my second point is one of the things I did, I've been looking at this charge for a long time now, um, but uh, paragraph style lists are always hard to process. And so one of the things I did was I took all of those qualifications out and put them in a numbered list. Um, and there are nine areas of expertise that we identified. Uh, but then as I looked at them, I thought, well, climate resilience, one of the important things at the on a municipal level we're going to have to deal with is stormwater. Why isn't stormwater management and water resources one of those areas of expertise? And I realized that we could very quickly start to just brainstorm a list of what's missing. Um, Councilor Schreiber mentioned uh, why isn't planning on there when certainly density development is one of the best things that we could do to abate emissions. Um, and so where I end up falling on whether or not this should be 100% experts or a mixture of experts uh, and, and stakeholders, uh, that, that position aside, uh, I also think that there needs to be, if we do keep the expertise, we need to think about um, whether or not these are, more, are too specific, whether or not there are ones that we are missing, because there's a lot, and this list has grown um, over the past several months. Um, but at the same time, it's, there's a chance that we have an oversight. And, and I think that Councillor Haneke referenced this, that in the future, you know, when we're dealing with a particular goal, we may find that we need a certain expertise that isn't represented in that. Um, and so I think that, that I'm glad we're having this discussion as a council because it's something that I've been trying to grapple with and uh, I'm glad that you're all judging my baby on this. Are there other, yes, Andy. I had been uh, hesitant to speak too soon after having been the maker of the motion in the first one in the last round. <laughs> I had thought about this issue as my other issue of concern also. And I sort of was interested in how the conversation has evolved because I'm going to just share with you um, what I would have, what I wrote um, in advance of the meeting, which was to change the first part of that to seven residents, four members to, um, excuse me, to include at least four members with experience, and then to take out the words from the pool of residents with her, and then take out the words with her acquired experience among others. So it would read, from the re, um, pool of residents, the town manager may consider inclu inclusion of members of relevant community organizations, et cetera. And it was trying to parse out, I was trying to parse out both of these things. And the reason was coming back to the same thing that I had presented earlier, but also I think has been very articulately presented by a number of speakers within the past few minutes. Additional comments, Shalini. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you looked at other uh, communities composition of these kind of committee, the climate change committees and what those look like, because I looked at uh, Keene, New Hampshire and Belfast and, and they have a mix of uh, stakeholders and basically um, there's, they have, um, for example, a cross section, cross section of organizations, institution, businesses, interests, and, and it's been shown and, you know, there's, again, like I said, there was research documenting that when um, businesses, industries, and residents begin addressing climate change, the entire community be benefits. So what I'm seeing is other communities that have cross-section of people, and I'm seeing research that supports that when you have diversity, in, you're gonna make better, um, you know, come up with better solutions. Um, I'm going to see, I'm gonna try something, okay? Uh, because I think we could debate this for uh, quite a long time. Uh, there seems to be some sentiment that you need some experience 
And at the same time, you, there seems to also be sentiment that you need to maybe not see this as the exclusive pool, but there might be in other relevant areas. And then there's also the idea that perhaps you need some people who are very interested and committed to this, but don't fit into one of these ex areas of expertise. But they have the commitment to try to serve in a way that would help bring this kind of thing to being in Amherst. So right now what we have is a motion to completely drop everything after the word residence. And I'm, what I'm hearing is maybe we don't want to drop everything. So the only way we're going to get out of that is to take a vote on that motion and then if, we, if it fails, is to come back and see if we have another way of amending this area. So I would like to, yes, Darcy. Um, I just would like to put out another possibility that people could think about when they're, if they're voting on Mandy okay. Joe's. Um, I thought of the possibility of putting a period after residence and then saying, experience with one or more of the following areas and the whole list um, and other relevant areas is preferred. It, the word preferred implies don't bother to apply if you don't have any. But I, we would add and other relevant areas because the town manager can only look at relevant areas anyway. So that would include land use or whatever, stormwater, what, uh, you know, a lot of other relevant areas, relevant to climate action, which is what the town manager has to look at. Steve. Steve. So the chances are really good if someone's gotten all the way down to reading the membership requirements that they're interested in the subject and you know, I, I think this has to be curated. So this is the, I mean, this is, these are town manager appointments. And that my experience with the town manager is that he consults, I would assume that he will consult with relative people before, you, you know, trying to curate what the composition of this committee, what, what the most effective kind of committee this should be. So I, I guess I'm, I'm still, and I'm sorry, we never got your idea fully out there, but That's okay. I'm, I'm in favor of one or the other. One which says, just put a hard stop to it and let the remaining, let the process be curated or split the, split the baby. Meaning some of whom? Some, some. Mm -hmm. A lot of baby references to that. <laughs> Evan. If I may ask a question of Councillor Haneke. Mm -hmm. um, your, your amendment is very simple. Um, I, I guess I'm just curious. So because uh, there is an expectation and also it's stipulated in the charter both that um, the town manager should be appointing people who have some type of relevant experience or interest or something to offer. And also um, because it's in the charter that we're looking for committees that are diverse, is your expectation that the conversation we've been having tonight about balancing expertise and also sort of inclusion, diversity, and stakeholder engagement uh, is sort of inherent in that simple simplicity because it's elsewhere? Or, or I guess I'm trying to, we, we, clearly we all have opinions and, and that one sentence might not fully encapsulate our opinions, uh, but I feel like you probably uh, agree with some of this. So I'm just sort of curious to hear your thoughts on that. Mandy Jo. Um, it is simple. And yet, yeah, as I mentioned in my first sort of reasoning behind this is the charter does require the town manager to look at relevant expertise and all of that. Um, so it, it's required already somewhere else. Um, but the reason, I, the main reason I made it simple, I think, has been shown through this conversation. If you start with a list 
it's really hard to get a group of 13 people to agree on exactly what that list needs to include. And we could be here for four hours if we decide we're going to have a list that says, and some will have this experience, and then we're gonna create a list of, first we have to decide how many are gonna be on that list and then what it is. It, I, that's really hard to do. Um, I had that experience on the Charter Commission when we were trying to create a list instead of just saying seek diverse residents, we were actually gonna name the list of diversity and that, that was really hard. And so we went back to a more generic seek diverse residents because everyone's um, thoughts on diversity are different on what those particular sectors are. So that's sort of the main purpose behind it. I absolutely agree that if we're seeking 90 day, the first set of appointments that we'll have a, for the seven residents, a one year, two year, three year term, they should probably be skewed towards experience and something that can put that out in 90 days. But then in another year, you're appointing two more residents um, that maybe you don't need them there at that time, you need something else. And so, yeah, I, mainly a simplicity that it's gonna be there by the manager because of the charter and coming up with a list is really hard with 13 people. Any other comments? Darcy. Darcy. Um, I just want to make sure people understand that the list comes from looking at the areas that have the most greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the first few uh, phrases or words on the list. Um, they're all, re everything on the list is related to, for example, Amherst greenhouse gas inventory and the emissions or climate resilience. Um, so all these areas are areas in which we would want expertise because that's where we have emissions. Just FYI, they're not just randomly chosen. George. I agree with Darcy. I, given the nature of this committee, if we're asking for expertise, this we could word it in such a way that it's not specifically seven or nine things, but without some sort of guideline or some sort of list, particularly one that's keyed to what this charge is trying to address, it's in theory just left to the town manager to pick any people he wants. Now, he's a smart guy, he'll, he'll make intelligent choices, but I would be a little reluctant just to take this all out and just have seven residents. Um, this is not just any old committee. Um, even for the, you know, other committees, I assume that there are, there's some description of what they're looking for. And I think we could word this in such a way that it isn't these seven things, and if not that, forget it, but it does give us a sense of what the expertise is we're looking for in this committee. Darcy. Why don't we just say relevant expertise and interest? Steve. So wait, I came up with my own list. <laughs> no. <laughs> so my, my list was land use, transportation, open space, site and building design, renewable energy, waste management, food system and public education. So that's how, why it's gonna be hard to come. Right. right. Yes, Alyssa. So I think, I think one of the things we've been spinning around here, and, and I really appreciate you pointing out, Darcy, the very specific nature of that, and that's why I disagree with Steve's list, is because your list is relevant specifically to where this committee is right now, yet in the future, this committee might need to be someplace else. So I wonder if it makes sense to, in try, terms of trying to reflect all that, to go ahead and give these examples, these specific examples, with that caveat that's been thrown around as to some of which should include people with these experiences. So, you know, not four have to or seven have to, but some of which should be in this area because that also does, despite what the charter says about um, 
what the town manager is supposed to do. I can tell you that previous appointments were based on, quote, merit and fitness, and that was a completely meaningless concept. And so um, hopefully this new charter phrase is more relevant relevant, but merit and fitness didn't really mean anything. And so giving guidance so that as everyone's out in the community doing outreach, as the community participation officers are out in the community doing outreach saying, we really need some of these things right now, but not they don't all have to have this, but we need some of these people because if it turns out that none of the people who apply have those things, then we have a problem because we're not gonna get anywhere with the 90 days thing. And then once the committee gets started, if we're like, you know what, that wasn't really, that is no longer the right set of things, and they come back and say, actually, next time you need to do appointments when we all quit because we're tired of this, um, pick the next set of things. Okay. But that's why I wonder if we could come up with a compromise. The motion on the table is to eliminate everything after the word residence. I'm hearing that somebody would like, some people would like to have something here. So I'm going to call the question on that motion, and then we'll see if there's a different motion. Call the question. And that is to eliminate everything after the word residence. So it, the second bullet reads seven parentheses, seven residents. Would you like a roll call vote, or would you just go with hands? All those in favor of that motion, raise your hands. Three. Those opposed? Okay, so that motion has died. Um, the, there are three people here that said yes, and the other people said no. Do I hear a different motion, Darcy? I move that we um, uh, put a period after residence and then start with the sentence, experience with one or more of the following areas, net zero energy building, energy efficient retrofits, climate change mitigation, advocacy research, clean energy practice policy infrastructure, community choice energy, green infrastructure for climate adaptation, sustainable transportation, sustainable farming and forestry, waste reduction, environmental or climate justice, and other relevant areas is preferred. There's a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Sarah. OK. Mr. Bachelman. Just clarification. Is the rest of, is the next sentence, and is, is there a period after preferred and then the rest of um, the next sentence deleted or included? Darcy? Deleted. Okay. And is that okay with this person that seconded it, Sarah? Mr. Bachman? Okay. Yeah. All right. And then the other question, however, uh, Darcy, you did insert something here about the uh, community action, community community choice. Yeah. That was not in the original motion. It's something I know you wanted to add. Yes, I would like to put that in there. And where was that inserted? Right after? Right after infrastructure. Okay, so in its community choice energy, right? Okay. And these Steve. are just preferred, just what? preferred, not required. It says, you said. Yes, yes, just, <laughs> just underlining that. And other relevant areas is preferred. Sarah, I just want to make sure that adding community choice energy, fine. So, um, Mr. Bachman, it was after the word infrastructure, semicolon, 
community choice energy semicolon. Before the green infrastructure Before for climate adaptation yes. is where it got added. Yes. Uh, Steve. Yeah, so I'm, for what it's worth, I'm almost okay with that. Um, I just take exception to the two parts about buildings and I would prefer a much more general something like sustainable building practices. So the first two are net zero energy building and energy efficient retrofits. And I'd rather see it be a more general sustainable building practices. So that would be a, um, that would be a an amendment offer to the of a amendment. friendly amendment to your, to your proposal. Uh, I, I would like to have net zero in the words in there because we, we have a bylaw. That's our law now. We're supposed to love it. Pat. <laughs> I'm forgetting what I was going to say. Um, uh, net, I think that uh, energy efficient uh, retrofits also is important in there. And for me, that brings in a lot of carpenters and, and other people, plumbers who worked on my house when we had a deep energy retrofit. Um, and it needs to be there because it, it goes beyond sustainable building. And I think sustainable right now is, there are too many definitions floating around there that aren't what I think we're looking for. Mandy Jo. So um, I still think it's a little too specific, uh, particularly something like green infrastructure for climate adaptation. That's the only place in this list that climate adaptation is mentioned at all, yet this committee is charged with not only dealing with greenhouse gas emissions, but also dealing with climate adaptation. And I presume there's more than just more ways to look at climate adaptation and things that you have to do in besides just green infrastructure. That's just one example of how specific this is. Um, the other relevant areas that is preferred, um, as Lynn said earlier, that that is a in if you're just a regular person who is very interested in climate action and you read the list and then you see is preferred you might be scared away from applying because of that because you might not have any of that experience despite the fact of how interested you are and how much you might have read and all of that and so I don't see it as the fix that we were just discussing that might be of opening up the potential membership to a mix of those that have this expertise and those that don't because you've got language in there that says is preferred and so versus some that's versus language that is some may have or should have that clearly indicates that not all have to have, whereas when you say is preferred, there's an implication that if for seven openings, nine people with experience apply and the other within these areas apply and 15 people without experience in those areas apply, the way the charge is written with the is preferred means that maybe the manager has to take seven that have that experience and you don't end up with the um, the the diversity and that that split that we're actually looking for if we want the split we should not say is preferred we should just say some should have or name a number pat uh, it seems to me if we go back to saying with experience uh, in or in pardon me Ex i think it's with it yeah, I'm pressing my button, honey. <laughs> um, uh, if, I think if we go back after seven residents, we're talking about people with experience uh, with or interest in and any of these topics. And uh, get rid of that, preferred. Those words were not in there. Yeah, right, I'm saying add them and get rid um, of preferred. Just to make it complicated for you, Lynn. <laughs> okay. 
Um, <laughs> Evan, I'm going to take your comment and then I'm going to try something. Okay, go. Uh, so I feel like we're in a bit of a Goldilocks situation here where Mandy Joe's amendment was uh, perhaps too simple for many of us. Um, this one still feels maybe a little too complex. Um, and, and the more I've sat with the idea of a list, the more I feel uncomfortable with it, even throughout this discussion, because we could talk for hours about what is and is not on this list. So net zero energy building is important, right? But what if you have an architecture who's really good with sustainable materials, but maybe hasn't worked on net zero energy buildings, but has worked in some type of sustainable construction? I, that doesn't really fit in here, right? Um, and so it feels a little bit exclusive that only people who have worked on net zero energy building, even if we all agree that that should be the goal, um, especially as it's sort of a, a burgeoning uh, thing, you know, it's the list still sort of lacks ideas about planning and land use and, and, and development, which I think are tied also to emissions. Um, and so I, I worry that any list of qualifications opens us up to an exhausting debate over what is and is not on that list and how specific uh, we should get um, beyond that. I mean, to say experiencing community choice energy is like a specific policy. So it's even, I mean, we have cl clean energy practice policies abroad, but CCE is, is one policy that we're saying or experiencing this. That's remarkably specific, I think, for a charge. Um, and so perhaps there's a middle ground. There was a counselor earlier who put forth an idea of some language that is maybe that middle ground that perhaps she would be willing to put forth um, to, to find you know a compromise between the two amendments that we've had before us so far. Darcy. I'm hearing people say that they want to have people on the committee that don't have expertise and are just interested. And I don't think the charter allows that. The charter says that the town manager has to seek to appoint people with experience and expertise in the relevant area. So to me, that means that that's what he has to do. Um, Steve. So the, I mean, the, the mission, so then we can simply go to the purpose of the committee and say that you must have experience and expertise in, can I read it off of yours? How do I scroll down? You, you should have um, experience and expertise in climate mitigation and resilience goals. So that's really, that's what the purpose of the committee is. So we could be general and say that you must have that. Mandy Jo. I, I guess, Darcy, I don't get why we need to put it in here if, if you truly believe that whether or not it's in here, the charter requires it, then why does it need to be listed? Why couldn't we just go back to seven residents if we truly believe the charter requires that all of those residents have that? I mean, I, that, that's where I'm having another problem. If I, I agree, the charter requires that the manager needs to seek appointments that have those. So why do we have to list it here? Beca because we... Kathy. Because you have to say what it is. We're not, you know, so, so I don't know whether you put an asterisk. This includes the following things, you know. But you, I don't see how you can leave the town manager to decide what we might have meant by what kind of experience, what kind of expertise, if we have some specific things in mind. And can you do it as a uh, footnote down below? These include the following, so it doesn't have a laundry list of effect to it. Can you write a charge that way? Um, the motion on the table, OK? is to say seven residents, period. No, 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 no. And then, next sentence. With ex experience with one or more of the following areas, and then we list them, and we say, or 
other relevant areas is preferred. The discussion thus far has suggested preferred is as good as saying must have. And the issue of the list, we could go on all night, and we're not going to. Um, it, we've said other relevant areas is preferred. So, um, I think we need to vote on this motion. And the motion is seven residents, period. Experience with one or more of the following areas, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and other relevant areas is preferred, period. And then we eliminate the second sentence. Unless there's an amendment around the issue of the word preferred, because I did hear that. Yes, Shalini. So I just feel like as a, as a council, I don't feel we have a consensus of what is the nature of this committee? What do we want it to look like? I don't, I'm not sensing that we have a consensus. We want the diversity. We want uh, people who are gonna be affected, a cross section of people who are gonna be affected to be part of this committee to have their buy-in. And, and that's a fundamental, I think, um, and that's why we're trying to reach this, which is neither this nor that. And so can we, is that worthy of a debate, that do we want that or not? So that goes back to the idea of saying some of whom will have experience. And also specific, specifying the way um, Keene, New Hampshire had that, and then what the others would be, they would represent a cross section of organization, institutions, communities, or. So if you're not saying that, it, and just saying that the, this is preferred, it's almost not uh, inviting that sense, like we want all of you from different um, sectors to be part of this, to shape this, because this is affecting you. Okay, I'm gonna call the question, and the question is on the motion. Seven residents, period, experience with one or more of the following areas, it, it's the full list of areas, after that, it says, and other relevant areas is preferred. Nothing else after that. I, and the community choice energy was added, yes. Do I need to reread it? Okay. If all those in favor means yes, means that you're in favor of this version. No means you're not. All those in favor. All those opposed. All right, that one just got defeated. I'm going to try another one. I'm going to try one. Okay. Who is the great compromise? Hmm? Who is the great compromise? Oh, maybe it was seven. Seven residents, some of whom shall have expertise with one or more of the following, and you can include community choice energy. Uh, and at, after the words, crim climate justice include in other relevant areas, there is no preferred or is preferred. And I don't see any reason to even have the whole conversation about the pool because that just, the pool is the pool. The pool is from any number of places and we hope it's broad. Do I have a second? Second. Andy seconded. <laughs> Can, yes. I have a question. I just want to make sure that we're clear that, um, and I, you know I love that word some, so mm -hmm. um, did we end the sentence then with waste reduction period, and then is the rest of it gone? No, it's waste reduction and environmental or climate justice or other relevant areas, period. Okay, so that's different. Okay. Okay, so can I just clarify again? So the start of it would be seven residents comma, some of whom have, mm -hmm. what, what's the start of it? Is that some of whom shall have experience with one or more of the following areas. We added in the words community choice energy and we added at the end and other relevant areas. How is that different from is preferred? It says some. 
meeting some of the people. Some of whom? So in other words, some of the people on this committee will have this kind of expertise. Others may have a strong interest, avowed commitment, but maybe they've never done an energy efficient retrofit. Alyssa. And to elaborate on that a little bit more, Shalini, I think part of what that then, having given that direction to the town manager, then the idea is if the town manager brings us all people who don't meet any of the sums, then we say, really, you couldn't find right. anybody to meet some of the sums? Or if the town manager brings us only people who have those things, but nobody from any of the intersectionality discussion we've had, then we'd say, really? Because it only says some. You, you had to pick every single expert. So it's a way of, of checking back in and saying, we wanted this combination. And you can pick the combination, but it can't just be one thing or the other. Remember, ultimately, we do confirm this committee. Yes, Darcy, other comments? Does it make sense to have that phrase at the end if you're starting it with some? Um, or other relevant areas? That's basically saying, Suppose there was another area that didn't get listed here. Expertise. Expertise. Just it. Oh, it leaves you lots of. It leaves you room. So that seems to. Are are we? Uh, I guess I've, I've repeated this quite a few times now, but does the charter not say that? every person on this committee has to have experience or expertise in the relevant area? Because I think it says that. So. We're pulling out the charter. We, 3.3C. Yeah. Exactly. Can you tell me the section you're looking for? That's what we are. Exactly. We're not experts. Well, maybe we exactly. No. Yeah. No, you're really asked to vote on things you're not an expert in. So I'm not. Right. Yeah. So you become that, or you become an expert or not? But we represent people. I'm sorry, Mandy Joe. Three point what? How long is this section? The Powers of appointment. Except as otherwise provided by this. Okay, this is the section being referred to. Appointments to multiple member bodies, except as otherwise provided by this charter, the town manager shall appoint all members of multiple member bodies. Members of all appointed multiple member bodies shall be residents of the town of Amherst at the time of appointment and throughout the term of the appointment, unless otherwise approved by the town council. All appointments to these bodies shall be subject to provisions of section 2.11. The town manager shall establish a resident advisory, then it goes on. In making appointments, the town manager shall seek to appoint individuals with relevant experience or, excuse me, with relevant expertise or experience. The town manager shall establish policies and practices to actively encourage a diverse pool of applicants for multiple member bodies. I think the issue here is what is considered relevant expertise or experience and seek. So, Mandy Jo? I was just gonna comment on the shall seek. It doesn't say shall appoint, they shall seek to. So that doesn't require the appointment of that. It gives a little bit of leeway depending on the applicant pool because we never know who will apply for what committee. 
George? I think we have to trust the town manager, and but also we know, as Alyssa's pointed out, that uh, there's a process in which we review his appointments, and if there's a problem, uh, we will raise it. So um, let him seek, and we'll see what he finds. <laughs> Additional comments? Yes, Evan. So I'm open to this amendment. Uh, I do remain a little concerned about the specificity of the list, and especially in the difference. So waste reduction is really broad, right? Like that could mean a whole lot of different things and leaves us open to a whole lot of different people who maybe have experience in reducing consumption or reducing plastic or recycling, anything like that, right? Um, net zero energy building is remarkably specific and pulls it beyond any other aspect of green or sustainable bu building. I, the, the one that I have a big issue with is including community choice energy, which is not a statement of my support or opposition to the policy itself, but just that it is a very specific policy that we're, we're encouraging them to have expertise in. And so it's, at that point, we could just start adding policies to it, right? Um, and, and, that, and that, to me, feels way too specific. I, I would be open, I, I would probably prefer not a list, but I would be open to a list if the items on the list were slightly more general. Um, so I like things like waste reduction um, and uh, you know, energy efficiency or sustainable okay. transportation or sustainable farming, but some of these things like community choice energy and net zero energy buildings seem far too specific and far too restrictive um, to include in this list. Steve. I don't think we're ready for prime time. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, about to, I'm about ready to send this back to a committee. The issue is which yeah, committee? It's 10 o'clock. We're on page yeah. one. We're yeah. Um, yeah. not yeah. going to be happy about however we we're going to vote because we're tired, but we're not going to vote <laughs> to, and, you know, I really second Councilor Ross's concerns about the specificity of, you know, a lot of this, which I think is attractive to a certain kind of a person, but really who I think is the most important are people that can think holistically. Alyssa. I want to go ahead and have the vote, even if it's not unanimous. I understand that we're tired, and I understand that we're frustrated, and I have no idea how we're possibly gonna fix it in another meeting, because we are never going to come to agreement as to what the list is going to supposed right. to include. We just have to come up with a close enough thing that we can tolerate it, and we can start appointing people to start doing this work, which is what we say is more important than whether or not we got the list exactly right. If the town manager comes back to us and says, I can't find anybody with any of these expertise, so I'm just gonna give you a bunch of enthusiastic folks, that'd be fine, but that's not gonna happen because we know that we have people in our community, some of them sitting right here in the audience, who are gonna apply with that level of expertise. So I'm not nervous about finding that. I'm just totally loath to postpone something yeah. when we aren't going to learn anything between now and then except that we're less tired. I agree. Yes, Margaret. May I read back the uh, composition as moved? Yes. All right. So seven residents, some of whom shall have experience with one or more of the following areas, net zero energy building, energy efficient retrofits, climate change mitigation, advocacy research, clean energy practice, policy infrastructure, community choice energy, green infrastructure for climate adaptation, sustainable transportation, sustainable farming and forestry, waste reduction, and environmental or climate justice or other relevant areas. That is the motion. I move the question. Mark Darcy, yes. that we say some, <laughs> I don't, it means I don't really that understand if that. the people that apply might have enthusiasm and maybe even experience, but not in the way it appears here. But the town manager through his process deems those people as good people for this committee. 
he recommends them to us. Okay, call the question. The motion as read by the town clerk. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I think it's, were you opposed? It's still had that system. If you are in favor of the motion the way the town clerk read it, then it's yes or aye. That the committee exists, yes. So okay. Right. Did you want to re-vote on that one? So if you are in favor of this, then you raise your hand when we say all those in favor say aye. Yes. And if you're not, then it's no. Or if you want to abstain. And it still has it. It's, it's the community joys energy in it. It has everything. <laughs> It has it all. And it even has the phrase that allows there for it to be other things. <laughs> okay. I mean, it leaves the door wide open for everything and anything at this point that is in this field. Okay. All right. All those in favor, aye. Opposed? Do you need a roll call? Okay. Abstained. Okay, motion passes. I'm sorry? No. It was 11 to 2. Uh, I need to just do a time check because I want to know how much else we're going to be looking to on this one because I think we may need to uh, either take a pause and go into the executive committee that we have asked for or refer this to another day, which I don't think any of us want to do. So, other questions? The general motion is now on the floor, and that is to accept the charge to this committee as it has now been amended. I do want to say, I believe from the earlier discussion on the motion that we have gotten rid of the word standing, and I think that's to be filled in later. That's part of a whole legal counsel reading, et cetera. Kathy. Okay, so I have something that is not substantive, all right? Okay. So it's not to what the charge is doing. Okay. Um, the appointing authority. Yes. Has the town manager appointing town councilors and then it's coming back to the town council to review the appointments including some of us and I think there's a separation of uh, power here that we're crossing over that's a very bad precedent that I've never seen a legislative body delegate to someone they hire appointment authority over them um, you know, I can't imagine a member of Congress saying that a department head in the federal government could pick which two members served on this. Um, so I, I think we're doing something that's precedent setting that isn't a good idea. Um, so I'm raising it and I'm, you know, think of it, if this was an education committee, would we have the town manager pick which of the two school committee members who were elected separately would yeah. serve so on it. I you can, know, so, I understand. So it's this, it's, that's the question. Yes, I understand the question. So what I would like to suggest, okay, is it's very clear that the town manager does appoint the seven people, okay? That is very, very clear. And I think more than anybody else here, we'd like to get started on getting those applications in and getting going. And at in a, the very near future, we can take this back to our council or our town attorney again and go back over that. But at uh, this you're point- You're absolutely right. For, for the other seven, no problem. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not gonna try to sit here tonight and debate that issue. I just don't think it would work. Mandy Joe. 
So I, I'm going back to what Steve just said about it's 11.15. We've talked about one thing. There are clearly some other things that some counselors may want to discuss but are hesitant to do so because it's, sorry, 10.15. It's 10.15. We have a larger agenda, yet I, I fear we would just push this through without that discussion, and that's a bad precedent to send to, especially with one um, where Counselor uh, Kathy just said she doesn't, it sounds like she wants to change the appointment authority of the counselors back to the council, um, which I don't, you, you didn't do a motion, but that is something that we've had a couple of opinions from the town attorney on um, that might, that type of change might contradict the charter. We may not like what the charter says in terms of who appoints who, but it's the document that governs us and we shouldn't, we can't, change that document and so to do this this late at night and pass a charge or potentially pass a charge that that we might not agree with certain things or say well we'll deal with that later i think that's a bad precedent to begin with so maybe we do just need to refer this to someone or maybe not even referral table it and bring it back at the next meeting for another thorough discussion about what everyone's concerned about and has changes for Alyssa. I completely disagree. We're totally close. We are so close. And I think you were exactly right in the part of what you said, which was that it is the document we have. It is stupid what you just said. It's not what you said is stupid. It's stupid the situation that we're finding ourselves in in terms of the town manager appointing town counselors. Part of the problem is the charter did not properly for Amherst style, envision town councilors being placed on a committee that weren't a town council committee, which is, remember that conversation when we started all of this? So that's where we've boxed ourselves in, by putting town councilors on a non-town council committee. And therefore, according to the charter, the document we have, it says this is how it works. The next argument to be had is whether or not the council president gets to pick those two counselors and recommend them to the town manager, or if we all talk about it, talk to the president, and then she recommends them to the town manager, or if he just picks names out of a hat and hopes for the best when he gets to the decision tree that the, another committee is working on. But in the meantime, we need to recruit the seven members, and we're not gonna get a change in the charter document to do what we think is weird. Um, and so we move along, and we start going. Mandy Jo. So I, I take issue with the fact that your statement of we are close because we've talked about one thing and no other. I, I believe there are counselors here that are hesitant to discuss things they intended to discuss tonight because of the time. So I don't, I'm not willing to concede that we are close to passing this because I don't know whether we are given the language in here. So, so that's why I'm saying tabling might be the best. I, situation Thanks. right now. Um, other comments? Steve. Oh, I just want to remind you all that we passed a motion of one of our first meetings that we have a hard stop at 10. And so I'm not sure, I'm not sure no, that. we never passed that. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, tabling, I mean, I, I think. Steve. I think that tabling is a reason we still have uh, other parts of the agenda. Question about maybe it's a point of order about tabling since that's not something we've ever done at town meeting and it's not something we ever did at select board yeah. and so it's a new thing to Amherst to be doing tabling. Um, we, we postponed, which is roughly the same thing. But when we postpone, there's a reason, not just that we're tired, not that some people are afraid to talk. If the president would wants to poll people and say, is there anyone who has concerns that they're not willing to bring up tonight, but they will let us know. So therefore, if they do. We won't have any idea what they are until we show up at our next meeting and we'll go through this all over again. I don't know what their concerns are. If people want to bring up their concerns and then say, but let's not decide, I'm fine with that. I'm not fine with saying, we can't talk about it tonight. We're going to show up the next time and we're going to hear it all for the first time and go, oh, okay, well, that's really interesting. Maybe we should postpone it again. Like, please speak up and tell us what they are and then ask us to, <laughs> to postpone the rest of the discussion. I'd be fine with that. But Walking away now, I have no reason to believe anybody has a problem with anything other than the things we already fixed. There's been a suggestion that I ask 
are there other things in this charge that counselors would like to discuss now or in the future? Mandy Jo. I have four other things, frankly. Okay. All right. I, I didn't want to take over anyone else who was saying that they might have other things. So I, I don't know how we're proceeding, but I, I raised Steve. my hand to say there are things that I have. And Steve, yes? Um, I had something that I wanted to. Okay. Discuss. Others? Shalini and Evan? Okay. Um. Right, and we don't have the right committee to refer this to. What, what I, oh. well, I'm just, if people have substantive issues with this, we have to talk about them as a group. Isn't right. that correct? You know, that I mean, is they, correct. Even if there was another committee, they could yeah. just have well, a chat and bring it back to us. I mean, we, right. we the 13 of us need right, to hear it. Right, but there, there is not a committee that is assigned to deal with substance. And that's where I would imagine most of the rest of the comments are, because the committee that deals with governance has already dealt with those issues. Pat. Uh, I think we need to hear from each of the counselors what their issues are. Uh, there may be um, parallel issues or the same issue coming up. Uh, I agree with Alyssa. If we don't know what they are, we can't prepare for them. We can't deal with them now or later. So let's go ahead okay. and people need to say what's on their mind. Let's start with Mandy Jo. I, I'm going to try and make it brief without necessarily going into reasons so that people just know. Um, I'd like us to look at the term of appointment for the counselors to change it from two years to one year. Um, I would like us to eliminate in number four. Could you be specific? Oh, in terms of appointment. It, right now it says three years for residents, two years or term of term yes. expiration for okay. counselors, and I, I would be looking at modifying that down to one year. Okay. For counselors, yep. not for residents. In number four, I'd be looking at ending the sentence after climate resilience planning and deleting the laundry list for similar reasons that we just spent nearly two hours talking about a different laundry list. Um, in number six, I'm sorry, it would end with G GHG reduction goals and climate resilience planning, period. Okay, thank you. Um, in number six, I would delete D and E completely. Um, and then I had some minor changes to number 2B and number 5B. language changes that probably don't affect the substance of the matter. Okay, and five, five B you said. Steve? Um, actually, Mandy said exactly what I was, number four, what Mandy said. Okay. Um, Shalini. I wanted to hear more about the public um, forums and what is the process of public involvement because it said there would be one meeting in a year and I'm not sure. So just more clarification of that. Um, and I was thinking of understanding the process for goal setting beyond the overarching goals that we have what are some of the intermediary goals? And also, again, um, um, if we could get a sense of in the report, would it include um, a roadmap and not just isolated um, policies or isolated um, actions, but what would the roadmap look like in terms of uh, what our goals are and what are the challenges we encounter and you know what are the intermediary steps what are the long-term steps and and so forth so like a roadmap 
And um, that's all for now. Yeah. Evan? Mine would be very quick, I hope. Um, based on the comment I had on the motion would be 6C, engagement of the public and relevant stakeholders in education, planning, and development of climate actions. I'd like to add after education uh, goal setting. Since goal setting is a big part of this charge, one and two, I think it'd be useful to make sure that's stipulated that that should also include the public. Anything else? That's it. Okay. Uh, were there other people over, Pat, any of you? Okay. Yes. Go ahead, Pat. Microphone. <laughs> um, under reports, I would be very interested in what the committee did uh, in terms of community engagement and how successful it was. George, did you have something? Okay. Others? I just need to do a time check with the town manager. Um, we were going to go into executive session and that required that another staff person be here. How would you like to proceed? Well, we have two staff people who are waiting, but that's up to you. you should, how do you want to proceed? <laughs> hmm? Okay. Yes, Andy. I was just wondering if the uh, president would consider appointing an ad hoc committee that would um, consider this charge and bring it back next meeting. Given the input that we presently have. Yes. I think that's necessary given the number of changes that people are looking at. And so I'd like to entertain a motion to create an ad hoc committee to take this charge and that committee itself will in fact look at substance. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Alyssa. I think that's a great idea and I think that one of the reasons we went ahead and had to go through our lists and if Mandy Jo wanted to go through hers more, um, was because we said it in a public posted meeting. So now this ad hoc committee can go back and say, so Mandy Joe, what, what were those sentences you said again? And Evan, what were those sentences you said again? And it's not like you're going around and deliberating. You're just fact gathering and trying to put it back together. And I actually have marked up my copy. So Kathy? If we set this up, can we limit it to things that were just brought up now rather than get a wholesale re rewrite of it? <laughs> so that we're looking at this document addressing the specific areas. Could we just have agreement that it's not going <laughs> to, you know, like that's, have... That's fine with me. Yes, George. So when this imagined ad hoc committee comes back, they're going to report to us what the objections were of these counselors. And make and recommendations. And make recommendations mm -hmm. instead of letting the counselors just speak for themselves so we can yeah. hear what their objections are. Well, the, the, the ad hoc committee would take what people have suggested during this quick survey, and they would come back with a recommended change. Otherwise, we're going to be sitting here for hours. This if, is, if yes. I count, it's, if it's Mandy, Steve, and Shalini, and Evan, and Darcy, where they're working this, and Pat, you know, I mean, we've got people who raise specifics, so if they're in the room, then they can repeat what they just said to us. So we're working on. That's fine. I have notes. Okay. So there's a motion on the floor. Did I get a second? Yes. Yes? Okay. I, excuse me. Of course I did, Andy. Is there any other comment on this? All those in favor? Yes. And Mandy Jo. I just wanted to add, I forgot 5D as one of my okay. word changes when I was looking at my document quickly, just to put it out there. Okay. Anything else? Evan? I'm not completely clear on this. Is 
the motion simply an ad hoc committee to hash out the remaining substantive issues, or does the motion include that that conversation be restricted to what was just brought up? I'm sorry, go ahead, Margaret. No, I think the suggestion was to restrict it. Restrict it, yeah. That's why Amanda Jo just made sure she mentioned that. I'm giving anybody else a chance. Where else do you want green lines in this thing? Because that's what I've got right now. Okay? The motion's been made, seconded, call the question, creation of an ad hoc committee to take this with those items that have been identified for which the counselors have questioned and come back to the council with a recommendation. Yes? Yes. All those in favor? I think it's, Darcy, your hands up. I know, reluctantly. Okay, it was unanimous. Thank you. Now I need to have people express their interest. Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That means we'd have to call a council meeting. <laughs> Anybody like to withdraw your hand? Me. Okay. <laughs> and we're supposed to have an odd number of people. Yes. To be clear, you're going to have to post this meeting. So I know. Put, put however many people you want on it. Does that mean? That's true. Yes. I, I think Lynn's point was if seven are on it, it also needs posted as a full council meeting, not just a committee meeting. It, that's actually a, that is actually a point of discussion I've had recently with our town attorney. And that is that since we have five people on most of, on all of our standing committees, if two more counselors plan to attend and be vocal, then we have to put, vote, post it as a council meeting. Yeah, but if you've got seven people on a committee and they're all from the council and they're all going to be vocal. It, it's a, it, w it would be a posted meeting if it was two people or if it was seven okay. people. The difference is if you have somebody come to a meeting you weren't expecting, that's where it gets problematic because you have more people associate. You have a committee and some people who aren't on the committee. If you have seven people okay. on the committee, okay. it's okay. But again, you probably don't want seven people on the committee, just saying. Okay. How, let's, it, I'm sorry? Pat has removed herself. Would I, could I see a show of the hands again? One, two, three, that's six. Can we have an odd number? Huh? You removed you? Okay. All right, five. So uh, the president gets to appoint to ad hoc committees, and I appoint to the following ad hoc committee. Darcy, Mandy Joe, Steve Shriver, Shalini, and Evan Ross. Okay. We are going to go into, yes. I just ask, um, we, since we passed the motion creating the committee, it, can we uh, get that going and, and start taking applications, get it on the form? It's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Paul? Yes, so we do have a press release ready to go, and you took action tonight in terms to create it. I'm assuming that nothing, nobody ch challenged the number of residents. Right. And so that's, that we can move forward with advertising for that. Okay, great, thanks. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to go into executive session. Uh, I have to get my language out. Okay, I ask that a motion be made to enter into executive session for the purpose set forth in the agenda item. So I'm good. Darcy's going to actually do the actual wording of what she has to say. Just, I move. Just right there. Yeah. Okay, right now? Yeah. Okay. I move that the town council meet in executive session pursuant to the provisions of GLC 30A, section 21A, 
one, to discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property if an open meeting will have a detrimental effect on the negotiation position of this public body. That's it. Okay. I hereby declare that an open meeting on the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property would have a detrimental impact on the council's negotiating position and further state that if the council uh, will, will convene in open session after the executive session. And I need a second. Seven. And now we do a roll call vote. Roll call vote to, is required to enter into executive session. And do we just say yes to confirm? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call your name. Say yes, say aye, please. Uh, Councilor Brewer. Councillor DeAngelis. Say aye. Councillor Dumont. I'm sorry. Councillor Greismer. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Councillor Pam. Aye. Councillor Ross. Aye. Councillor George. I mean Ryan. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor George Ryan. We both say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Shane. Councillor Schreiber? Um, aye. Councillor Steinberg? Aye. Councillor Swartz? Aye. Okay, it's unanimous. Me. And me. Oh, Councillor, aye. Councillor, aye. Councillor, thank you. <laughs> unanimous. We are actually going into this back room, so you're welcome to sit here. We expect to be gone maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Ha ha. Okay. We are going to reconvene. Okay. We're back. Um, we're going to move to, uh, to agenda item 6A, the um, Council Rules of Procedure Ad Hoc Committee. And uh, there is a report of that committee and then um, a motion to adopt additional interim rules. Alyssa? Our motion sheet has some acceptance of reports, and I don't know why, because we don't normally do that unless it's something like a recycling and refuse management report that we're accepting. I don't think we need to do that with committee reports. I think that that's just extra words that people don't need, but that's a process thing we need to work out is, for future. Is that a question uh, that you care to speak to? We, no, we fine. Do that. All right, we're not doing Typically. that. Typically. And like we didn't do it for governance, like we heard their report, right? but we didn't accept it. So you don't have to accept our report for rules of procedure, but we have many documents. So what you saw in the original packet that was published many days ago was the action items. It was not written on a letterhead at that time. It just said rules of procedure, town council, ad hoc committee, recommended action, and that had the motion, which I'm not actually making yet, to adopt the interim rules of procedure dated January 15th as amended, because figuring you'll change something. Under the Amherst Home Rule Charter, section two, 6D, uh, my eyesight is fading apparently at this hour, and 10.7 P1I. And basically, here's the deal. So you remember way back when, when we got the original rules and procedures from the bylaw review committee. And we sat here and we tore it apart. And we said, yeah, this is duplicative mass general law. This repeats what's in the charter. Let's just do the basics. And then we'll have this committee go off and turn it into something else. Well, as it turns out, one of the sets of basics that we pulled out, according to the charter, we needed to have in there in order for them to count as our interim rules. And so what we did is, if you look at, I know there's so many documents here, if you look at the, you can look at the beautiful marked up one that you got at, oh, I don't know, midnight, and, um, but there's also a clean copy of it that show that basically what we did is we tacked it at the end. This was not an elegant solution, as it mentions in the report, um, but it is something that seemed workable. The only other change, substantial, the only other changes that were made to those things that you voted on December 3rd, they say December 4th because that's when various uh, corrections were made based on our discussion on December 3rd, is if you were on the marked up version, and this is 
we're not doing this on the overhead, et cetera, and we're all exhausted. But basically, the differences are outlined in the report, which is, for example, we didn't consistently use town councilor, town councilor, and sometimes we said councilor, and so I just tried to go in and do a find and replace and fix that. There is a section under hearings that I added in the part about the form on the master plan, just as we had already had the part about the form on the budget, and mentioned the citation for free group petition, and if that turns out to be wrong, then we can fix that later. But the part that got tacked on at the end is the part that's directly from the charter, which is charter section 2.6D, which says rules of procedure have to include the following things, like you have to meet at least once a month, like you can, minutes have to say this, that, or the other thing. And we'd taken that out because it was so obvious. Why would we need to put it in there? Well, it turns out we needed it in there. So. It's in there now. If you vote for that, then we will have fulfilled our charter obligation to have interim rules, and the Rules Procedure Committee will continue working away at making a much more elegant and user-friendly document for everyone to use within our six-month deadline that's also called out by the charter. The other change is that the charge itself has been altered slightly to reflect that, to reflect that we just are basically updating and we will have then complied with the interim rules part of the charter and then we still have the six months to figure out the rest of the rules, which is May 31st. But we don't have to act on the charge. It's changed. But, you know. <laughs> yes, no, Mr. Bachman? I believe, did I? We could, by consensus, just agree that it's been updated to say that. And the other thing that happened is we had sort of an interim sort of charge format that I made up when I suggested it to the energy group, and so I reordered some things. So it's just reordered. And you'll see at the end it has less text, more just bullet points. But the content that's changed is it's showing that we have complied with the charter if we agree that the thing we voted on December 3rd, which appeared to be sort of temporary kind of interim rules, are actually our interim rules. I'm going to call for a vote on the revised charge, just to be clean, okay? Uh, do, do I hear a motion to ex, uh, accept the revised charge? Motion's been made. Second? So, Mandy Jo? I, yes. I haven't. What are the changes to the charge? I haven't been able to see on the charge of the Rules of Procedure Committee an actual redlined version. I haven't You're found right. it. So, can you actually tell us yes. what those changes but, were? and I don't have my mic down. Um, we received a hard copy tonight of what it was. Right, but we have, this is what we approved before, and we have, it was my mistake. I thought I provided a red line, but I hadn't on the charge itself. I'd done that for the rules, but not for the charge itself. There's a clean copy. It was supposed to be 8 o'clock when we talked about it. I guess, what are the amendments to it besides the changing of, like, location of things? Oh, the original one, if you turn over the one that we had in our packets, thanks to Margaret bringing these to us tonight, you look at the back, it says reports. It has a bunch of sentences. Instead, now it has two bullet points that say, a proposed set of interim rules no later than February 1st, in the citation, a proposed set of permanent rules no later than May 31st. Instead of saying, the ad hoc rules of procedure committee shall bring to the council. That changed. Instead of membership saying, the committee, five members of the town council, it says five town councilors. And we added the citation under legal reference way back at the beginning. It just said 2.6D. 10.7 PI, um, 10.7 V was just a completely incorrect citation for term of appointment, um, but it's 10.7 PI. That's what happens when people are in a hurry changing things. That's what we did on December 3rd when we were cutting things apart, and then on the 17th when we did this one. 
Um, but 10.7 PI is that transition section, and that's where it said how we could get together and do the rules ahead of time, and that if we did the rules, they had to include this extra section that we'd cut out that we've since put back in. That same extra section is, in fact, right here on the charge as well. So it's like you should become very familiar with it because 2.6D just keeps showing up over and over again. It was right here in the charge itself, but it was no longer in the actual interim temporary rules we adopted on the third. Questions? All those in favor? Unanimous. Okay, let's move on to the actual uh, additions to the interim rules. And again, if I could just make clear, this is gonna look way better. We're already making progress on how this is gonna look when we do it at the end, but as you can see, this is just what was left when we pulled it apart before. And that's why if you look at the redlined version, it's almost all blue. The blue stuff was the stuff we cut out back in December 3rd. And uh, the red should be mine, which is mostly just moving things around a little bit, adding a couple citations, and as I mentioned, referencing that our discussion about what hearing format is like is different for the hearings on the master plan and on the budget. Do I hear a motion? It's a motion to adopt the interim rules as amended. The citations actually on our motion sheet. I'm sorry, thank you. It's to adopt the interim rule, rules of procedure dated 1-15-19 as amended under the Amherst Home Rule Charter section 2.6D and 10.7P and I. A motion has been made by Kathy, second, Pat. Any further conversations? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. We're now moving. Uh, town manager's report, Mr. Bachelman. Such a long town manager's report, but um, <laughs> a few things. Uh, the Just want to let you know that uh, technology is up. So tonight we've been live streaming our meetings, uh, been broadcast through Amherst Media, but also live streaming through our website. Um, Second thing, some, we had kind of um, advertised that we were going to be talking about the North Common tonight, and there's plenty of time tonight, I think. But um, uh, what um, basically is, if you recall, uh, we had originally looked at uh, redoing the parking lot, the Main Street parking lot, and the North Common. We decided those two things should are, in, are intertwined, so we should look at them together. Um, we, there was a committee that looked at this, developed a lot of reports, made a uh, presentation to the select board uh, towards the end of their term. Um, and part of the project was, what, part of the recommended action was to reduce parking in part of the Main Street parking lot. It was, it was called the bold option. Um, it's a significant issue for the town, something that gained a lot of attention. Um, and we knew that there was a lot on your plate and that if we didn't get a really quick decision from the council, we wouldn't be able to do construction this summer. And so knowing the number of things on your plate and how you, um, with the schools and everything, we decided to postpone and, um, this whole conversation uh, for two reasons. One is so that there's, the council had more time, but also more importantly, we have a consultant coming in to do a study of the parking and that consultant's already started, and so we hope that we'll have that information for you when it comes time for you to make a decision about what to do with the North Common and the Main Street parking lot. We anticipate that that will happen later this calendar year, so it's still a live project, the money is still there, and we hope that we'll bring it back to you then. Um, I'm doing one of my Cup of Joes on Friday, February 8th at the Lone Wolf with our sustainability coordinator. Um, you probably have read about Hampshire College um, making some announcements. Uh, we've, I've been in touch with uh, the president of Hampshire College. Uh, there's nothing imminent with Hampshire College, uh, but it's a significant uh, employer, a significant landowner for the town. We care a lot. Uh, things hap whatever happens at Hampshire also in influences the neighborhood and development in that neighborhood as well. So we're keeping a close eye on what's happening there and it's unclear what is going to happen. They have a board of trustees meeting uh, next week, 
So I think so there'll, there'll probably be some news that comes out of there. I hope some news comes out of their Board of Trust Meetings meeting. Appreciated everybody who was able to, to attend the MMA meeting in uh, Boston last weekend. I thought it was a really good meeting. And I really appreciated, I think the whole town appreciated how all the counselors came together to escort Nancy Eddy over to the opening session where she was recognized and gave a speech, which I thought was a really class thing for the um, MMA to do. Uh, the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization has a vacancy because we had Doug Slaughter, who was chair of the select board on that previously. Uh, uh, Lynn Greisberg has been um, nominated to take that seat. It's a seat that's voted on by South Hadley, East Hampton, Northampton, Hadley, and Amherst. There are two other candidates, so the president has been working the polls, as it were, um, to <laughs> that ensure that uh, Amherst retains that seat. Uh, and I think that's, that's going forward. Um, there's a terrific, uh, pr probably one of the best uh, Martin Luther King Day uh, events that we've had here. Uh, we, were, we weren't here, but um, they had a really good presentation, one of the largest turnouts and uh, everybody who went said the food was great. It's just one of the best ones that they've had. I'm sorry we, many of us missed it because we all had, everybody in this room had another obligation. Um, congratulations to LSSE and to the Community Theater for a great production of Peter Pan. They had to cancel their last performance uh, because UMass shut down on that Sunday of Martin Luther King Day weekend, which was unfortunate because that was their closing performance. And hope I don't know, I haven't heard a report on how much money they lost, if any. Uh, so, and the last thing is to, and this came up earlier uh, on your resolution or your proclamation about Black History Month. That will be Sunday at 1.30 to 2. It's a very brief uh, ceremony. It happens in front of Town Hall. Um, so if you can be here before, on your way to your Super Bowl parties or wherever, um, it's, a, it's usually a really nice ceremony. And I sent you uh, electronically uh, information about the event. That concludes my report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, moving on to eight. Uh, we uh, did go to the town council for a read on when the president appoints and when the council appoints. And based on that, I developed a memo to you dated January 23rd. I attached to that memo the council's opinion, I mean the attorney's opinion, and I also attached to that the Excel spreadsheet that I developed based on the polling that I did with each of you on which, which committees, both standing and others, you were interested in. Um, of all of the committees, the only committee that I now appoint to is in fact the bylaw review committee and be based on people's interests. Uh, I'm appointing Alyssa Brewer, Pat DeAngelis, Evan Ross, and then two external people, Bob Ritchie and Bernie Kubiak. Those do not require approvals. The other appointments, however, are by the town council, and I have made a suggestion based on the um, polling that I did, and then I have to say I looked at the balance of who is being asked to do what, et cetera. Um, and I also talked to several of you because I needed to create balance. So for example, um, the Finance Committee uh, wrote their charge so that the Participatory Budget Commission needed to have a Finance Committee person on it, and yet the only person that mentioned interest in it was Evan, and he was not interested in the Finance Committee. So. Um, I went through this puzzle. I think I had about seven iterations of this chart till I finally made those. I do say in this, for the appointments by the town committee, these are recommendations only to you. If you do not accept these recommendations, I would suggest that you refer all of this to the appointments, to the um, Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee, and, um, that, and that's fine with me, either way. Kathy. Um, I have, uh, I want to speak to the way we're making the appointments, so I'm not questioning necessarily the people. Um, when I think about what 
the design, and there is a motion to amend in your packets, I think, a written one. When I look at the way the charter was designed and the way it was um, described to the public who voted on it, one of the things that was stressed was it would be a very democratic process. We'd have 18, 13 council members with no concentration of authority in any single person. And in fact, we don't, we even review what the ma our manager is doing. And so what I proposed is that when we, the council, um, what the legal memo said is when it's a committee that's not of the council, it's us, the council, that's doing the appointing. So we can decide on a case-by-case -case basis how we want to do it, um, including let the president make recommendations. But what I would like to recommend for the three in front of us, so the Joint Capital Planning Committee budget and participatory budget, is that we consider not just taking the president's recommendations or referring it to a committee, but actually saying who's interested in these positions and taking a vote on it. And this would both have a process that didn't invest in authority in any single person. And so it's not a question so much now of was this fair or not, but if you think of the future, the precedent we would be setting is the president is appointing pretty much all the positions um, without a discussion. So. I, my understanding, if I think of the way things were done before, we're in a new world, but select board would talk to each other about who wants what, and often there didn't need to be any kind of vote because people distributed themselves. Um, so my motion's before you, and I can read it um, if you need it, me to. It's in, to amend the motions to these specific committee, so I'm just focusing now on the three in front of us, for a different procedure. We'd have the council members here indicate which of these they're interested in. If there's more, too many people for the slots that are available, we have people say a word or two about themselves, why they think they're capable of it, and then we would put it to vote. So that's the motion. Um, that I have before you. And I, I just, I'm on the Rules of Procedure Committee, so I've been looking at how do other towns handle this. And several of them, Randolph's one, say it's a majority vote when a council member is going on a committee if there are more people interested. So I'm thinking of the future, not trying to concentrate authority in a person. The charter doesn't have a mayor. We made a decision not to do it that way. So the motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Steve, is a second? Can uh, we clarify what the motion actually is? Is it is what the language that was written in the, the sheet we got today? The motion that I have is to amend the motions for council appointments to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, Budget Coordinating Committee, and Participatory Budget Commission motions 8B1, 8B2, and 8B3. And under this procedure, the council members would in, indicate interest in serving on these particular bodies. If the interest exceeds the number of seats available, the council as a whole would take a vote after hearing short statements of interest from each member wishing to serve. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Mandy Jo. So I, I have a question. Um, is this an intended procedure for this one time of those appointments? Because this is going to come back probably yearly for uh, everything but participatory budgeting for BCG and JCPC. Or is this the intended procedure that you're hoping the council will adopt going forward for these particular committees until we review that procedure so that when they come back next year that this is what we do again? I originally wrote this broader, saying that whenever we have a situation where we're appointing a council member, that we would go through this process. And it made sense to me that I confine it just to this, because I'm amending the, th the three motions. Um, so in my view, it would be a good process to adopt 
going forward. I mean, we clearly can revisit these things. We, we can decide we want to do it in a different way, but I think it's a healthy thing. And if I think of, say there's a situation where we have a contested vote for president, which we didn't have this time, it was unanimous. Um, you don't want a situation, you don't want the risk of a situation that there was favoritism among uh, different factions on the council in any way, and somehow people just weren't getting the things they wanted. So this avoids that risk completely and doesn't depend on having a fabulous president who's trustworthy. So, uh, you know, I would see it going forward, um, but clearly it's just amending the motions in front of us, and this is a yearly decision we would have. Other comments, questions? Oh, I'm sorry, Alyssa, yes. So, uh, appreciating once again, I don't think we've had the whole analogy about flying the plane tonight, so we have to say it at least oh. once every night. Um, governance hasn't had it, I mean, governance hasn't talked about it, obviously they may talk about it because their pur purview seems rather broad, actually. Um, rules certainly hasn't talked about it, and this is the kind of thing one might perceive as being within rules, and obviously that's one of the reasons it came up, because Kathy's on rules, she's vice chair. Um, I am also very uneasy with the charter that we have from the standpoint of all the authority that's invested in the town manager and in the council president. That's just a fact, that's where I'm at. Nonetheless, given that those things are true and given that the council president clearly does have the authority in the charter to make the appointments to things like our standing committees, I'm not sure that it really benefits us to say, well, we can pull these back if we make a rule, so why don't we pull these away from the person? But I would like to see, so what I, what I would like to do is I would like to say, to defeat this motion, and I would like to say that this should be referred to rules to talk about for future reference, given that we wouldn't necessarily have an excellent president who asked us our opinion and that it, a contested election, both of which I think are very valid points that have been made by Kathy, but I think at this time we would be better off, given that everybody did provide the context of what they wanted to our current president, that she should go ahead and make these appointments and this should be referred as a possible incorporation into the rules. I want to be very clear. I'm not making these appointments. I'm recommending to you that you make these appointments. And, 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 and if you choose not, no, but there's, that nuance has been there. I did a poll and I've come back to you with the results, and I am recommending to you that you make these appointments based on the poll that I did. So what? I'm sorry, so I thought I originally understood that until I heard this motion, so I guess I'm not understanding how this motion what, changes that. What Kathy is suggesting is that in taking the poll, if there are more than the number of people um, required by the committee charge that want to be on that committee, that the, it should come back to the council and the council hear short statements from each of the potential candidates and the council actually vote by candidate, not by recommendation. My alternative was to just refer this back to the committee that does appointments. Mandy, you're, Mandy Jo. I was just gonna say, I think given what's here, we have three options potentially tonight. Yeah. One is yeah. to have a, the mo there's a motion on the floor right now to say these appointments go by indicating interest tonight if the interest exceeds the number of available tonight, the council would vote to take, after hearing short statements, would vote who's serving. Another option is to just make a motion to adopt the recommendations that Lynn, our president, has made. And another option is to refer those recommendations right. or That's even exactly the appointments right. in general to the um, Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee. That's correct. Those are the options. As and, but the motion them. on the floor right now is the one that Kathy has made. Kathy. I, d I just want to make one clarifying comment just to speaking directly to something Alyssa said. And I, 
I always think you're totally right <laughs> on this, but the reading, and it's a hard to read memo from a KP law, I think, but they basically concluded that the vested power is only for the council, the committees oh, yes. we create. Right. And for others, we're making the decisions. We're not taking power away from the president. Right. Right. If we conferred it, we'd be expanding the authority. So I'm trying to restrict, and, and I agree that the wording Lynn has suggested is not taking the authority, it's, it's offering us some choices. It's trying to move the process by giving you the information that I obtained through a poll and saying, if you don't like it, send it off to a committee or do something else. Evan. So I understand the concern about the town council president um, being able to make that decision. Uh, that said, I think that the procedure outlined here actually makes me fairly uncomfortable um, because what it becomes is that for these three committees, we have like a series of mini elections um, to those committees. And, and to me, uh, one, that's time consuming in a body that doesn't have all that much time as we've seen tonight. Um, but two, what we end up having is, is the prospect of potentially um, Councilors, you know, whipping votes within the council to try and get on a particular committee. Uh, we could have lengthy votes of trying to see who, who can be on what committee. Uh, I think that our president did a lot of work to, to figure out how to put these. Uh, she was also very transparent in providing us how everyone ranked things. Uh, I got some of my first choices. I got some of my third choices. Um, and so, you know, if you look at some of these like JCPC, there were a lot of people who wanted to be on that. And I would worry about having essentially an election in the council to figure out who gets to be on it, um, especially absent, you know, our president was able to sort of to take the 30,000 foot view and say, okay, here's what we need to do. How do we allocate this? That's something that we can't necessarily do within the context of the council easily um, because it takes a lot of time and thought, which I'm sure she put into it. And so I, I, I worry about that procedure and my preference right now would be uh, not to have this motion to, ex to accept, to vote and accept her recommendations now and have the rules committee figure out a long-term policy for how we're gonna do this. Additional comments, Darcy. I agree that the Rules Committee should look at this, um, but um, I, I agree with Kathy that, um, that we, we need to somehow or other um, have a procedure that the council itself can use uh, to make appointments and that it um, it feels you know it feels like um, I can understand what Kathy was describing that you know if if Lynn makes an appointment uh, or if she makes recommended appointments that feels it's harder not to accept a recommended appointment than it is to vote on the people that you want on the committee. Um, so I would agree with Kathy's motion. Additional comments? There's been a motion on the table and seconded. Any additional comments? Call a question. And the motion is to amend the motion for council appointments to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, Budget Coordinating Committee, and Participatory Budgeting Commission. And under this procedure, council members would indicate interest in serving on their particular bodies. If these interests exceed the number of seats available, the council as a whole would take a vote after hearing short statements of interest from each member wishing to serve. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Okay. There was one abstention? Oh, okay. Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Of Kathy's motion? Three. All those opposed? 
abstain. There's one abstention. Okay. So hearing, so that motion has failed, although I think there's been a strong suggestion made that this be something that be taken to the Rules of Procedure Committee. I strongly recommend that as well. Um, so we now have before us two choices, either to vote on the recommendations or to vote to refer this to the uh, Communications Outreach and Committee appointments. I'm uh, willing to accept a motion. Actually, if we do them, if we take the motions now, we do them by individual committee, or we can just do a general referral. We're on item C. We are, we are on item B1. So the motion sheet is here, or it's a general referral to outreach, communications, and appointments. Alyssa. So could I make the motion that's on the motion sheet to appoint council members to the joint cap, et cetera, et cetera? Yes, you can. And could I just combine them, unless we think we're going to need to separate them, um, to the joint capital planning committee, to the budget coordinating group, to the participatory budgeting committee? Am I missing one? Um, is that all of them? Um, as recommended, as by, recommended to the, by the town council president. Motion's second. been made. Is there a second? Second. Evan, second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Two opposed. Abstain? Nope. Okay. Uh, we're now moving on to the town. Oh, we put. Let me just mention B4, okay? We are going to start to need to do the appointments to other committees. And this basically says that those committee appointments um, will immediately be referred to the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee and then brought to the council so that we don't have to bring them here, refer them to the committee, and then bring them back. So there is actually a, a motion in this case up on four. And the motion, as it's read on our sheet, is to refer to the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee resident appointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Planning Board, Ranked Choice Voting Commission, and Participatory Budget Commission, Budgeting, Budgeting Commission. Alyssa. Could we just clarify and say all resident appointments rather than, I mean, because there aren't any right now, right? But what we're saying is any future ones as they come in, is that what yes. we're trying to do? Yes. So we don't have to have a separate vote here, as you just said. So in some sense, there are some that we have to start appointing. The, the, um, those committees just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, ZB, ZBA has openings. Um, planning board may or may not. RCV, we passed a charge and we have, as a council, three appointments to make to that. Mm -hmm. um, participatory budgeting, we passed a charge and as a council, we have two appointments to make. So you could argue there are some appointments open that the council needs to make. There might not be applications yet for that, but the appointments need made. My argument being there, there can't be any appointments made if we've seen no applications, and so therefore we have nothing at this point. But people were confused when they read this. They thought we were getting names tonight. Right. There aren't any names because oh. we don't know if there are any applicants right. for the many openings <coughs> that we have on various things. But what, I guess I'm not too red wedded to the words, but I don't know if we need to insert a word or maybe it's just fine as it is. It's basically any and all resident appointments to these boards so that as those gatherings of applicants magically appear, they will be immediately referred to the appointments group right. and it will not have to come back here first. But see, all of none of those are ones that the town manager has to tell us about. There's something we don't yet know none of us knows, including the people on the appointments committee, um, 
how we're going to fill those things, but you're basically handing it over to us just as potentially there might be a future motion along these lines that when the town manager needs to bring forward his appointments that we need to automatically assume that they're going to the appointments rather than that we have to wait for a town council meeting to vote to send them over right. to us. This motion, it's basically trying to be right. efficient. This motion is specifically for these committees to which we need to make appointments. Excuse me, Mr. Bockelman. That's not true for the resident advisory. So, so we do have applicants for all of these um, committees. We don't know what to do with them until you come up with a process for how you're right. going to manage your appointment process. Um, we can deliver those however you ask us to. Um, also, there are some shared appointments where uh, someone might say they want to be on the ranked choice voting. The manager has some appointments and the council has some appointments. So we should coordinate right. our efforts along those lines and have that conversation. But I guess we are, uh, you know, our outreach officers have received uh, community activity forms with people who have identified these committees that they'd like to serve on. Um, and so just like to know what to do with those. Okay. So this motion refers to the Communications Outreach and Appointments Committee any and all resident appointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Planning Board, Ranked Choice Voting Commission, and Participatory Budgeting Commission. That's the motion. Do I have a, do I, <coughs> do I have a second? Second. Okay, further comment, yes. I, I have a question, right? Yes. Um, so for one set of this, zoning and planning, mm -hmm. we are the only appointing authority. Yes. And for the others, the town manager is appointing some, and we're That's appointing correct. the other. So is my, it's my assumption, so I'll frame it as a question, that somehow the appointments committee will figure this out, mm -hmm. because there'll be a pool of people who want to be on these things. And <coughs> town manager's picking some, and we're, so not zoning and planning, but this other set is a very different kind of set that, that you kind of jointly need to see the entire list. And, yeah, and okay. we would assume that the chair of that committee at least would meet with the town we'll manager. We'll try to figure it out. Yeah. Yep. Yes, Steve. Um, so I have a question about some of these committees because some of the current members are on holdover appointments. That's correct. Have, have they filled out these citizen activity forms? So were they known to, are they known to be in the pool? Mr. Bachman. So after your action tonight, we will notify the people who are on the holdover status, um, specifically for the planning board, and ask them if they would like to be considered for a permanent appointment by the council. And zoning board has a vacancy of a full time, but there are three associates, I believe. But typically, that would be a decision of the council to decide who's going to be a full member. Plus, to fill the one vacancy currently there, plus there's two other, if it moves from three member committee to five member committee. So yeah, there's three appointments to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the council. Yes, okay. Uh, additional questions? Yes, Alyssa. So just to be clear, this blank look on my face, the, we know none of this. The appointments committee had no idea we'd had any applicants for anything. Right. Um, and so this is all breaking news. And so if any of you have individual ideas that you're as concerned that the outreach, newly renamed today, Outreach Communications and Appointment Committee might not have thought of, feel free to share those because we have nothing at this point in terms of structure. But we know, because we have two upcoming meetings, we're gonna have something for you soon. But it's, um, it's not today. Right, and, am I, and I am correct that you had an election today as well? And Sarah is the chair of that committee, and Alyssa is the vice chair. Thank you, both of you. Um, okay, so the motion's been made. Do it, did I have a second? I think I did. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It looks like that's unanimous. Okay, uh, town manager appointments. Does the newly Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee have a recommendation. 
it would be unfair of me to pass this off to our brand yes. new chair. It was done since, under you. Since I wrote it this morning at 1.20, and she didn't get elected until like, I don't know, 9.50 this morning. So, um, yeah. So you see the motion sheet. It has the very specific language that cites, as you know, I'm so fond of, the citations associated with the various parts of the charter. And the thing that was the nice little tricky part about this one is that although it's normally the 30 days on committee appointments, it said 60 days of when we took office is when we have to confirm these. And we've all talked before about the fact that the Board of License Commissioners is going to need to do some work because the town manager's been covering that position up until now and they've got to get trained, et cetera, et cetera. We, as I said in the report that um, you had a, a one pager and then you got another report this morning that we didn't have anything to work from. They're just names and addresses and some maybe some people Googled them and maybe they didn't. We are developing decision trees. We, are, we have two upcoming meetings. We've already had two. We have two more in the pipeline. But at this point, it, it's not that we're telling you, these are the most amazing applicants ever, but we are so appreciative of them. I'm sure they are the most amazing applicants ever, but we have no idea. We're just assuming they're terrific and that's why we really want to get them appointed so they can get started and we can fulfill our obligation under the charter. So the motion's been made and seconded. It's made, is there a second? Sarah, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And opposed? And abstain, none. Okay. Um, so we have five sets of minutes. I second that motion. As amended. Except as amended. They've all, they've all had amendments. They've all been. Yeah. We moved that they be accepted as amended. And there's a second. Kathy, are there any other questions, comments? All those in favor? All opposed? No, it's all unanimous. Thank you. And we have. Um, on our agenda, we're moving to any more committee reports? Finance committee. Finance committee. I think the I, finance committee has been sent to you in writing and it was available for the public in the back of the room today. And uh, it's not to be discussed tonight. It's an item that's going to be discussed in the first week in February. That's it. Any other committee reports beyond what you've already spoken about earlier today? I want to just say how thankful I am that all of these committees are up and running, and you are running because you're doing a lot of work. Public comment. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment? Please, and thank you for your patience. Uh, do I need to make this hot? It is. Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Tripp. Um, do I customer provide my address or any? I'm an Amherst resident. Thank you. Um, and this is the second meeting I've attended. Uh, my public comment is that if you guys were planning for poor open access and visibility, you couldn't have come up with a better way to do this. Uh, the live stream this evening has been audio only since the start and I informed Amherst Media and they were aware of it but fixed nothing. The live stream never returned from your executive session that was scheduled mid-meeting off agenda. Your executive session ran long, I don't know what you did, that's none of my business at this point. Um, <laughs> the obviously you guys running long and figuring out process is none of my business. Um, you just approved minutes that aren't in the packet um, 15 and 16 aren't posted online. Maybe your packet has them, but um, they aren't part of the public record, and um, um, it's fine. They it's, are. Uh, I just looked online just right now. Um, in, on the public packet that I saw, there was they were not posted. Um, this is a kind of a, I'm happy to see recent minutes showing up. Um, you guys have been really late at approving even draft minutes or posting draft minutes, so. Seeing uh, five, I'm hopeful that uh, subsequent meeting approvals, uh, minutes approvals will occur in the meeting following, um, or at least the presentation of draft minutes. I'm, again, excited to see that, but 
it's a little scary to see um, five meetings worth of minutes where no one has had any comment on them. I assume none of you read them because if you didn't notice, they weren't posted that's, online. I mean, that's I guess, we actually are not supposed to comment I, back to you. Um, but that's my sort of. If you all approve that unanimously, likely you don't actually know what you approved. Um, and since you've scheduled public comment after all items on the agenda, there was no opportunity for me to make any of these comments and bring them to your attention prior to anything, as well as you've cleared the house so that anyone who wanted to comment on any of the other items, notably um, the superintendent's uh, presentation for a large school thing, also is just impossible to do by anyone who can't be here at 12.01 AM um, for a meeting that started at 6.30. Um, so uh, I appreciate you guys trying to work this out in the time, but um, I, I expect more. And that's about it. Thank you for your comment. Are there any council comments at this time? We did list a couple of additional uh, meetings on our agenda. For the time being, I'd like you to continue to hold Tuesday, February 12th, but we may not need it. Is there anything else? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? A second? All those in favor? Thank you.